Hi there. Welcome to another episode of But Seriously, the Cancer Podcast. My name is Bert Scholl. I'm a two-time cancer survivor, a cancer survivorship guide and coach, and I'm the creator and host of But Seriously, the Cancer Podcast. To learn more about my services or about the podcast, please go to BertScholl.com. That's B-E-R-T-S-C-H-O-L-L.com. We'd also really love your feedback, which you can provide by going to the BertScholl.com contact page and filling out the form. Please do. And follow us on Instagram and Facebook at But Seriously, The Cancer Podcast, and on Twitter at But Seriously, TCP. And make sure you check out our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash But Seriously, The Cancer Podcast. And thank you so much for all you do. Caroline, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great to meet you. It's nice to meet you too. <laughs> so will you start by letting everyone know what you were diagnosed with and how old you were? Sure. Um, I was 27 and I was diagnosed with a stage four follicular non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Stage four. And you said yeah. follicular? Follicular. How yes. do you spell that? F-O-L-L-I-C. U L A R. Is that right? Okay. I can look yeah. it up. And what does that mean? I, you know, I think there are, I, I mean, I think last I checked, there were 42 ish subtypes of non Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I think there's B cell, there's T cell, there's follicular, there's, I guess, non follicular. And I oh think my diagnosis probably has a longer name than what I'm remembering. <laughs> but, you know, I think when I was, to be honest, I was thinking about this earlier this morning of the actual name of the, 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 the diagnosis that was given. And I don't remember because I think, you know, you're so overwhelmed when you hear all this in general, you kind of stop listening oh. after um, about the word cancer or stage four. And that was something that I think actually the whole time I've kind of just trusted my doctors, my husband, everyone around me to kind of deal with the actual logistics and words and you know all of that and I've just sort of said what do I have to do so I actually you know I don't know exactly what follicular is I totally get it Mm -hmm. the first time I was diagnosed I did a lot of research but I remember very little of it what I remember is preparing myself for treatment yeah uh thinking about if I'm going to live and trying to figure out how I'm going to work or if I'm going to be able to, you know, a lot of illusions like, oh, I'll be able to do this and be able to do that. It's like, "Mm -hmm." just wait till treatment starts, then you're going to find out. Well, that's it. I mean, when I was first diagnosed, I was in medical school and I was, it was, I was Thanksgiving when I was diagnosed and I was studying for finals. And I'm pretty sure my first question after hearing the diagnosis was, well, I can't do it yet because I've got to go back and take these finals. And my dad's a, a physician and he looked at me and just said, you are not taking these finals. You know, this is mm. your light. Like you've got to, everything's changing right now. Everything just changed. But it was in my mind. It was just, you know, it was just an impossible thing to process of just yeah. denial. It was just denial. Yeah. And, 100%. and there was no time to take the finals first. Oh, there was no time. I mean, I think I was diagnosed the day before Thanksgiving and um, the Monday after we went to Indy Anderson and I started, I think I took about a week and did all of the testing, you know, the, all of the tests and baseline tests, you name it. And then I met with my doctor a week later, the following Monday. And that's when she had said stage four, at that time, it was everywhere. It was in my stomach, my spleen, my bone marrow, which is what made it stage four. And I think I was admitted 12 hours later and started chemo that, that quickly. Um, no kidding. Yeah. So, Like within a week, you were getting chemotherapy. Yeah, exactly. And really, I mean, within 12 hours of really learning the whole, the full picture, it was... Um, it was, it was incredibly fast because I guess at that point it was so widespread and it was an aggressive, very fast growing cancer. And they only think it had been growing about five months. And so I guess 
it shows really how quickly it was growing, which really kind of added to the denial because it was almost like this, you got to be kidding me. You know, it really, I had no time to process it. So I never really did. I mean, I think my whole first, you know, bout with cancer, my first, I think I went through eight rounds of chemo the first time I, it was, it, it sunk in, but not really. I mean, I always say like, it scared me, but it, it didn't hit home. It just didn't. I was 27. I was young. I still, oh you know, was had this invincible feeling and, uh, it was hard and I was scared, but I never, I don't think I ever really thought I'd lose my life or it, the magnitude never hit me. It just, not that time. It just, it just it never did. So there was just no time for it. There was no time. Yeah. Mm. And I mean, I think you would agree because you have to have that time to process and the importance of really, you know, um, being honest about the situation. Say that again. I think that, you know, it's so important. Well, I guess with anything, but really with a diagnosis to, to process it and it's hard and it's scary, but you have to let yourself feel that to really move through it. Yes, does that there, make sense? it does make sense. There arrives a point when a part of you is ready mm -hmm. to let in what mm -hmm. really is happening. Mm -hmm. And I've spoken to people who for that, I've spoken to people who for that experience didn't arrive until everything was over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, versus, you know, as well as, as well as anywhere throughout the whole process. You know, for right. me, I, gosh, I was diagnosed and told to go home and, you know, think about where I want to do chemo. And then I, you know, woke up the next morning and just like, you know, oh my God, I, I have cancer. Holy cow. Mm -hmm. And uh, had a couple of months to decide where I wanted to begin treatment. So it was really difficult, obviously, in the beginning. And then I think it was like a month before I finally mm -hmm. came to. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, if this is going to be my life, mm -hmm. I'm going to live my ass off inside of this life. Mm -hmm. It took about a month for the denial to go away. You know, it's like, this is what you have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you, on the other hand, you just like stepped in. Um, you have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and we need mm -hmm. to begin treatment mm -hmm. immediately. So mm -hmm. how did you find out? Um, well, that, that, that is a crazy story. Um, so at the time I was a big marathon runner and I started doing triathlons and I was pretty type A. I mean, you know, this was a med medical school student who was, you know, this compulsive runner and, and not a whole lot of fun to be around. It was just, <laughs> everything was very regimented. And um, I, my brother loves to climb mountains. So he had come to me a few months prior and said, hey, let's go climb Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa over Christmas. So that was our plan. We, you know, we had the trip booked, everything was ready. And so I guess maybe two months prior, I, I knew I had the endurance, but I didn't have a lot of strength. And so, um, I just finished my seventh marathon, just finished my third triathlon. Mm -hmm. And so I started training with this weighted vest and doing, um, the Santa Monica stairs, which if you're not familiar, just, I mean, gosh, hundreds of stairs up and down a vest. And then I started weight training. And at that same time, I remember looking in the mirror and seeing my neck and I mistook it for muscle. And I was so proud of myself because I was oh, bulking up wow. and, and it really coincided perfectly with all of the training and, you know, and I, in retrospect, remember putting on deodorant and feeling what I thought was a new muscle. Um, so yes, in retrospect, I do now know that that was not muscle, it was actually, <laughs> you know, um, a lymph node, but I never had a symptom, you know, I was, I tired maybe, but I was kind of always tired and never mm. had night sweats, never had, I mean, I, I never had anything truly not one symptom. So I'd flown, um, I was living in LA 
I had flown back to my hometown of San Antonio, Texas, to meet my brother to get our vaccinations and blood work to prepare to go to Africa, you know, what, a month later. And we did the blood work and I got a call saying that my platelets were at a life-threatening level. So they assumed it was a mistake. So I had to turn around, go back, redid the blood work and it confirmed the result. And my dad is a doctor in San Antonio. So he got a copy of the results called his good friend who is a hematologist. And I was in his office a couple hours later. They did a ton more blood work, but I'd never met the doctor. And when I met the doctor and walked in, he looked at me, you know, with his trained eye and just said, how long have those lumps been in your neck? And I said, thank you, because I thought he was complimenting, you know, my, mm -hmm. my rigorous mm -hmm. training and, you know, all the results I'd made in progress. And, and that was, that was it. You know, he did a very quick, I think it was two, three minute exam and asked me to come into his office. And my dad was there and, you know, he just said, could be a virus, but I think this is lymphoma. And I, you know, I didn't, wasn't familiar with lymphoma, hadn't gotten that far in med school. I just, I didn't understand at all in, in that moment. And then they arranged to have a lymph node removed the following morning. So the next morning had a lymph node removed. We got the results back later that day. And, uh, you know, I went from, from getting ready to go to Africa and, and take finals in med school to, to uh, none of that absolutely nothing except just enduring the treatments and trying to, you know, save my life. Yeah. That's scary. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think it, it's scared. I remember, you know, when I told a few friends, which made it a little bit more real, you know, saying it to other people, mm -hmm. I remember, um, and we've talked about this a lot since it really, um, it shocked people, but it, it really, it rocked them. Because I think I heard this several times, like, good God, if that could happen to you, you know, because I was, you know, on paper, this poster child for quote unquote health, you know, like yep. I, there wasn't anything that would have explained it or made sense. So it sort of was this, well, none of us are safe, you know, which of course is true. But I think when you're young and you hear that, it really shook people even more so um, with that which was an interesting thing to see how that played out in terms of friendships and stuff. Yeah, that's well put because mm -hmm. it does shake people. And some yeah, yeah. people come to you as a result and mm -hmm. some people run mm -hmm. as a oh, result. Yes. I was a runner when my friend got diagnosed before I'd ever yeah. had cancer. I ran away from her until she called me and asked me where the hell I was. <laughs> she was a powerhouse. <laughs> uh, I love that she called and, and just asked you as opposed to, you know, assuming you were gone forever. That's a good friend. Yeah. Well, you know, she was in a, she had been in a the same uh, leadership program that I had been in. And once she completed it, she was my mm -hmm. coach. She exactly. had, mm -hmm. she had a coach or coaches who were accountability partners. Mm hmm who were there to stand with her and support her in what getting what she needed. Mm -hmm. And clearly they got to a point in a conversation where she was supported in, in reaching out to the people in her life who had vanished. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why, I mean, yeah, I'm a life coach, so obviously I'm a cancer mm -hmm. survivorship coach. So obviously I'm a big advocate for that, but it's just like, mm -hmm. it was a beautiful example of, of what happens when you partner with someone in the, creation of your life big picture and like mm -hmm. you know day by day mm -hmm. when someone's standing with you you know they said to her like you know well why don't you call them mm -hmm. she called me and said where are you and within minutes i burst into tears mm -hmm. i was like i'm mm -hmm. so sorry i thought you were gonna die and i freaked out she mm -hmm. said well i didn't die mm -hmm. when are you gonna come see me <laughs> wow or i'm not dying you know and i've told this story many times in this podcast because it's just so powerful it's just yeah you know it's in and, and, and I, I also have all the space in my heart needed for people who don't want to call mm -hmm. people in their life and say, where are you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that's, that, that's a, that's mm -hmm. a, you know, she's a heavy hitter. <laughs> that's, that's, that's incredibly powerful. I yes. think there's so much there. There's so much behind that. I think, um, that is, that's pretty incredible. That's pretty incredible. 
Yeah, and that it provided me a lot when I went into, when I was diagnosed. Mm-hmm. I kept a blog. Mm-hmm. And as you and I were speaking prior to the beginning of this podcast, mm-hmm. you know, I had been in that leadership training program, and a big piece of it was, uh, you know, telling on yourself, mm-hmm. telling the truth about the parts of yourself that you don't want seen. Mm-hmm. So then you can have power in that area of your life because once you once you reveal it, you know, mm-hmm. as we were talking about with Brene Brown, you know, once you reveal where what you're hiding, mm-hmm. you no longer have to hide it. Right. And it actually creates connection with people. So I'd had training in that uh, approach mm-hmm. and, you know, wrote in my blog to everybody. I told them all the whole story about my friend Mary mm-hmm. and said that. So if you haven't reached out to me, like mm-hmm. I want you to know I love you. Mm-hmm. And. I don't take it personally because this is really hard. Mm-hmm. And like when you told the people in your life mm-hmm. that you had cancer, it's like it, 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 it shakes people to the core. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it's, and it's slightly different from those of us who get diagnosed because for most of us when we get diagnosed, it completely shatters the illusion of immortality. That's right. You're like, oh my gosh, like I'm... I wasn't one of those people. I'm not one of those people, whatever those, whatever they are, even your imagination makes those people out to be. Yeah. You're not one of them. And now right. you are. And you're like, well, if, wait a second. Mm-hmm. Life is not what you thought it was. Right. Mm. I think too, to add to that, I think, you know, when you're younger, I think we don't have as much life experience and we're obviously not able to, to, um, be as mature and, and about it. And I think also when we're younger, we're still kind of under this illusion that, that life is going to work out and it's going to be great. And, you know, we really don't want to see the ugly side of life. And then we, you know, we live and we, we experience life. And I think we all sort of emerge realizing that life is not a fairy tale and it is not this happily ever after for anyone really. And life is, is full of struggle and it's full of beautiful, beautiful things as well. But I think the older we we are, the more we really understand that we connect with each other in that struggle. And, you know, yours might be a, a financial issue. Yours might de- be divorce. Yours might be depression. Whatever it is, yours might be cancer. We all have something, you know, or multiple things. It's like fill in that blank or blanks. And I think when we're honest about it and when we are really able to talk about it, that's when we all are able to put our guard down and find that connection that is so incredibly, and so incredibly powerful because we're not alone. None of us are alone, but we can feel alone if we're not open and honest about it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And that's what you bring to your audiences as a speaker. I hope. I hope. I try. <laughs> <laughs> I try on a good day. I do. <laughs> oh, no. I listened to the uh, video on your website. Uh-huh. Tell everyone your website. It is uh, DearRileyRose.com. Riley Rose was um, my rescue dog that I found in between my first um, battle with my cancer and my second. And we uh, briefly on Riley and sort of the explanation of why it's on him, we, we kind of came together. He was being put down. He'd been horribly abused. Aww. I was in a very weird waiting period of having been told that my cancer didn't have a cure. They could treat me, but they couldn't cure me. Mm. So getting into remission for me was this weird, okay, the waiting period has started until my cancer comes back. So how do I live and wait? You know, how, what do I do? Like, how do I go from this ex type A runner, you know, med school student to just waiting? It was very hard for me. So my husband and I had just gotten married, moved into our rental house in Santa Monica. And one day I Googled rescue dogs, saw this sweet thing who'd been abused, was being put down that day. And I went and got him. My husband thought I was insane. Landlord did not allow dogs. This was a great Dane lab mix. There was no hiding this, this huge thing. And Riley and I just began, we just began to heal each other. You know, I began to heal him once he trusted me and he was just on this whole journey with me, you know, the cancer, kids, motherhood, you name it. He was there. And, you know, I ended up writing a book and it's titled Dear Riley Rose. And the way it came about was um, I found whenever I was 
talking to him, you know, or with him or even really talking about him, you know, he was that one being that I never had to um, pretend around or be Mm. okay for, because I think we could all agree, you know, I had such a guilt of what I put my family through and I had such guilt over knowing the emotional toll I'd taken on them and the physical toll of just having to help me and be there for treatments and, and all of it. Right. And so I tried to be okay around them. And then, you know, I had kids and I had, I wanted to be mom and I wanted to be okay. Even if I was anything, but it was just, I think, you know, it was what I tried to do, but I could go into my bedroom door, close the door and Riley could be there. I didn't have to talk. I didn't have to smile. I didn't have to do anything except just be. And he gave me that permission to just be. And I did did not, I would have never known that's what I need. That is what I needed. That is, he filled in these cracks and just made me, uh, I don't know. It's weird. Made me trust, made me believe in myself. He gave me this quiet strength and just this constant, uh, constant, silent companionship that, that many days I credit it, it got me through. It, it just, he got me through. So he, he's been huge in my life. Huge, huge, huge in my life. That's so beautiful. I mean, I can envisioning the two of you yeah. being a support to each other mm-hmm. and, and what that relationship provided. But also when you mm-hmm. said, I didn't have to be okay, mm-hmm. you know, that's just... I mean, heck, that's my life right now, you know, as a man, uh, you know, and when it comes to intimacy issues that I have, I just discovered this like last Thanksgiving, like, oh my, wait, I'm one of those guys with intimacy issues? No. Huh? Me. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Look who's single at at 50 years old, you know, (laughs) no longer married. Um, Yeah. And I saw that. and, and, And what's come up is, is the fear of truly letting a woman see me yeah with all the stories of you know as as much work as i've done and softened to myself and allowed myself to be Mm -hmm. to be intimately related to a woman and have her see me Mm -hmm. and have it not mean that i'm weak when i don't Mm -hmm. feel strong Mm -hmm. and to not you know the fear of that you know keeps it from happening you know Mm -hmm go back to my childhood experiences and, you know, and and how I grew up and it would make sense to anyone why I don't want myself to be seen. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I just also happened to be like an intensely sensitive human being Mm -hmm. who was, you know, by the time I was 19, I owned a motorcycle and I was decked out in leather from head to toe, black leather motorcycle with black saddlebags, low rider bike, you know, because (laughs) trying to convince myself as I believe I'm convincing the world that I'm tough and strong and can handle it. Uh And so you got to go be with Riley where you didn't have to be strong in front of people, a similar version of that where like you want to be strong. You feel terrible that you're the reason why your loved ones are going through this grief. Right. Right. And and you're so young. I'm curious how aware you were of Uh Were you able to distinguish between the mind and the thinking that Mm -hmm. this is my fault? And then were you able to observe that, um, be the observer of that thinking and, 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 and know that, no, I'm not, Mm -hmm. I didn't, it wasn't a a life choice Mm -hmm. (laughs) or was it really just, again, with Mm -hmm. so much so fast that you weren't able to. That's a good question. I, I think, um, not at the beginning. I think that I, I don't know if I felt I deserved it, but I maybe deep down felt that it was, I don't know if I thought it was my fault, but I I definitely thought on some level it was, I guess this was in the cards or, and I, and I definitely, um, I am, I've always been a people pleaser and like you, I'm highly sensitive. And so I think the way it's always been for me, my whole life, childhood through with, with those closest to me is I'm very, I want them to be all, I want them to all be okay and happy. And I, I don't want to be the source of their unhappiness. Mm -hmm. So I think really 
it was more of this delusional thought I had of, well, it's okay. You know, I know that they're scared and I know all this, but you know, I, I can, I can smile through this and I can be okay through this. And, um, it, it wasn't very honest, you know, I mean, it took me years to really dig into to the honesty of it, but I, I guess I thought that I could, um, I, I put a lot more pressure on myself, I think, than I would now. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't think I was, I call it like my evolved thinking, you know, I mean, I've come so far in sort of understanding who I am and all of the thought process that goes behind it and forgiveness and self-love and all of that. But I think, um, where I am now with it is I, I think trauma in people's past plays a big part. You know, I think back to when I was telling people, you know, when I was diagnosed, it's like, why, what happened? You know, they, everyone kind of wanted a reason why. And oddly, I don't know why I never did. I never really I never really cared. I don't know. Maybe deep down, I always thought I kind of already knew it in a weird way. And I'm kind of realizing this as I say it out loud right now, but I think I just sort of, um, uh, I think the trauma from the past paired with my sensitivity, my people pleasing, and just the uh, refusal to ever really acknowledge it or look at it. It was almost like God was trying to hit me over the head with a sledgehammer. Like you need mm -hmm. to stop. You're not going to go that way. I want you to come this way. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really listen. So then the second diagnosis hit me again, you know, it was like, no, 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 come on. We're going to go, we're going this way. And that one, I sort of listened a, a little bit. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll entertain the idea. And then the third diagnosis was, that was my surrender. That was me saying, okay, look, I get it. I cannot do this by myself. You know, I, that's when I let down all the, uh, the walls, the barriers, the facades, you name it. I mean, that's when to those around me, it's look, I'm not okay. You know, so I'm so sorry if this is hard for you. And I know this is hard for you. I'm not okay. And this is not okay. And I don't know if this is ever going to be okay. But it took me that, it was such a long process to let go of really trying to control the situation and control how those around me felt and reacted to what I was going through. You just told my story. <laughs> well, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I can so, so empathize with you. The first time I got diagnosed, there was a whole lot of growth. You know, there, about a month in, there came a point when I said, okay, I didn't think this. It just dropped into my mind. The thought was, this diagnosis is a gift. Mm -hmm. And if I live or die, mm -hmm. what I am having is the opportunity to experience this profound struggle and, and be with it and let it in and allow myself to grow. And I got like, if I'm going to die, I'm going to live my ass off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what that means for me is what's most important to me is emotional connection uh, with friends, with my loved ones. Mm -hmm. uh, what I love more than anything is conversation, odd mm -hmm. that I'm hosting a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I just, it's, it's magical for me when we, you we get one-on-one -on -one with a person, just get yeah. to talk about the most intimate aspects of life that we struggle with. Yeah. I mean, and so the first time I got diagnosed, that happened. But then uh, my marriage ended three years later and I was healthy. And then I was diagnosed again 10 months after my marriage ended with a stage mm -hmm. four metastasis. Mm -hmm. And it's like when God said, mm -hmm. okay, like I tried to wake you up the first time you didn't listen. Yeah. Now do I have your attention? Right. And for those right. of you who are listening, like I personally, I'm not, I, when I say God, I don't mean whatever was taught to me when I was a child, as far as right. religion exactly. goes. I mean, you want to call it the universe. Yeah. You want to call it, uh, you know, awareness, whatever, whatever it is that you believe yes. is like, you know, that woke me up and yes. you know, the, 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 my, my marriage ending, that was kind of like the, uh, <laughs> number two. And then number three was the second diagnosis. And, mm -hmm. and that's when I, uh, unbeknownst to me, sought out a, a spiritual teacher. Mm -hmm. Um, and she brought to my attention how deeply my intuition actually runs. Mm -hmm. I just thought I was a knucklehead. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Well, I kind of think I still am, but mm-hmm. as far as intuitively, there's more intuition there than I realized. Mm-hmm. And then that's where I found um, meditation. I got back into meditation. I'd been in and out for years, you know, I was kind of curious. But then I, you know, found a spiritual teacher on that she turned me on to, would listen to him on YouTube, and finally went and did like, you know, did a, did a week long silent retreat with him, did another one a year later, found another spiritual teacher, like this, like these interests that mm-hmm. always spoke to me always pulled on me mm-hmm. I always wanted to go but there's no way I was going to do it and have you know a I had no business doing what I truly wanted to do and b you know what would people think mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know and, and it took the second diagnosis mm-hmm. to just be, to have me go you want to know what yeah wow I thought I was living my life and being true to myself like mm-hmm. Nah, you, that was the tip of the iceberg. Like, you ready right. to dive in now? Yeah. And that's when I gave myself over and I said, I don't mm-hmm. have to make decisions about my life. I get to ride shotgun. God's driving. Mm-hmm. And all I have to do is pay attention yeah. and be willing to let it in. Yep. And yep. It, that doesn't mean don't put intention behind my life, but it's really just, what does that mean? I want to make that clearer. You know, it's... uh. I recognize that life itself, our individual life, is the perfect and most efficient curriculum we need or if we want to, you know, fulfill on who we truly aspire to be. Mm-hmm. Life is laying it right there before you. You don't have to do anything. All I have to do is follow the follow the path and do what mm-hmm. what's before you and you know and and do what inspires you and do what you love and, yeah. and and go through whatever comes at you and it will give you just what you need and i could hear that in your speaking as you were mm-hmm. saying like mm-hmm. yeah. like okay like I, I woke up yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i i woke up and i think you know once like you i i i know you know again, what the, with religion, God, all that same thing, you know, I think it's very personal and what it is to you, but what I realized and what I think once you realize you can't ever not know is that, that I call it the God voice, that intuition inside, you know, I mean, I think I've talked and I'm sure you have too, to so many people who've gone through, you know, cancer and whatever the traumatic experience may be. And they all say that was one of the, the biggest blessings was listening to that voice and, and, learning to listen and let it guide you and you know every morning now like my prayers sometimes are two words I pray for clarity and courage Mm. clarity to be able to listen to it and really you know follow it and the courage to follow it you know wherever it's taking you because um uh, you know we all know we don't have control like we thought we did you know once you go into a doctor's office and your life changes forever um you you never are under that illusion again that you have control and that's a tough way to live sometimes so if you do surrender and you know that that voice that intuition is guiding you you do over time learn to trust it no matter which way it takes you you have a peace about that yeah that's so well put you know we don't want to believe that we have no control over our lives mm-hmm. and when I recognize that I have no control, Mm -hmm. there's absolute freedom in that. Mm -hmm. I get to Mm -hmm. just be, I have no control over this anyway. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just in recent weeks, I would say somewhere between when the pandemic started and, you know, a few weeks ago, there was, somewhere where you know i was working talking with my therapist and i realized oh my goodness like i'm not experiencing gratitude for this life Mm -hmm. and i'm not present to the fact that it's going exactly as it needs to go Mm -hmm. because there's certain areas of my life that aren't working right now Mm -hmm. and I want them to be working. I want them to be working differently, and I was feeling frustrated, and I was feeling, you know, having, you know, wake up in the morning and hopelessness greets you and says, here, you want some coffee? Mm -hmm. And and then then you get a little more awake. You're like, wait a second, hopelessness. Like, you're not me. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and whatever that thinking is like go away because you know mm-hmm. and, but then like it shows up physically in my body and for mm-hmm. years sensations in my body told me that that if there's a sensation in my body along with the fear and the hope and the hopelessness whatever it is then it's real mm-hmm. you know what i mean like because when something yeah. feels wonderful something wonderful happens and you feel it in your body it's even more real but mm-hmm. then that belief had me believe that the hopelessness and the fear mm-hmm. was real. And so once I got a handle on that, I can be like, oh, you, good morning. You, really? You had to wake me up? Couldn't one of the other guys woke me up? <laughs> one, of the, one of the happy can't wait to f- start my day ones? Yeah. But no, like it was, mm-hmm. you know, just hopelessness that woke me up. And so, but when I'm present to the fact that I have no control over this life, mm-hmm. then I'm in a place of gratitude. Mm -hmm. and I look at what comes to me Mm -hmm. as the next part of my curriculum. Mm -hmm. And -hmm. it's just the back and forth with that, right? I think that's kind of the human experience. Yeah. (laughs) If if, if that's how you look at it, you know, you just, you go back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just, uh, well, and I think it's the experience if we're lucky because it gives us, you know, the chance to, to, to know that and to really experience it the fullest that we can as opposed to just going through what we think we should be doing or need to be doing. Yeah. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's like sailing. It's a, tra- it's like a trajectory. Mm-hmm. It's like when yeah. you say when you're tacking into the wind, you have to go back and forth. You don't get to go in a straight line. Mm-hmm. And I feel good like analogy. life. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> that was a good analogy. I like that. <laughs> oh my goodness. So that was great. Thank you. You said well first i actually want to ask how does how is how is riley spelled r-i-l-e-y okay i thought so so when everyone's looking for your website it's dear r-i-l-e-y rose.com that's right that's right yeah um but going back to you said you're you were a stage four it was widespread so Mm -hmm. non-hodgkin's lymphoma that starts in the lymph nodes that's right and it Mm -hmm. left the lymph nodes and it went to multiple organs it did. Mm-hmm. And what organs was it in? Uh, spleen. I don't know if you would count stomach as a bit of an organ. And then bone marrow, I, I think. think so. You're, you're the doctor. You tell me. I know. I know. <laughs> well, remember, I didn't get through the finals. so did, You um, didn't go back to med school? No, I didn't. I didn't because um, after I finished my first eight rounds, I was doing maintenance chemo um, once a week for four weeks every six months. So it was basically a month every six months. Um, and I thought about it. I thought about going to work. I thought about going back to school, but I think knowing that it, the cancer was coming back and then also knowing I had these maintenance treatments that I was going to be doing, um, no one advised it. And so that was where I was in this very, very, very difficult place of well, then what do I do? Like, it just felt like I was just waiting. I really was just waiting for the cancer to come back because. Really? Mm-hmm, it was a very, very um, difficult way for me to live at that time. Again, because I was still young. I was still pretty driven. I was still wanting to, to, to do things, you know? And so Riley became my project, rehabilitating him. Mm-hmm was my, was my goal. That was my new goal. I could focus all my energy and attention on that. And so my cancer did come back fairly quickly and, oh man, it was a relief. It was a, okay, great. Now we can get this thing going because we knew that the next step was a bone marrow transplant. And we knew that my brother was a perfect match, which Interestingly, siblings usually are not a perfect match. They can be, but it's not a very high probability. So he used to always joke, he's three years older than I am. And we were, we were close growing up, not that close. And he used to always joke that I was adopted because we're so different. We are so (laughs) different. And he called and said, I guess you're not adopted because I'm a perfect match. So knowing I had him as my donor, we could move very quickly into the bone marrow transplant. So we had the plan in place. We I want to pause you. The answer to come back. Yeah. So I, I, hmm. you just said so much right there, you know, that? <laughs> but there's so much value in what you said. Like, first of all, like you and your brother, I don't know if you've been to Kilimanjaro since, but like, no. 
that was your Kilimanjaro right there, as I'm mm -hmm. listening, like the bone marrow transplant. Like, I'm just mm -hmm. going to get all choked up. Like, your brother got to do a bone marrow transplant with you. Like, he did too, actually. This was that, the first. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. your Kilimanjaro. There's your, there, there's mm -hmm. your lifelong connection. Mm -hmm. Beautiful experience. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah he, um, you know, I think growing up, he is this, uh, he's a very... Uh, he's, you know, he played football in college, offensive line, big, strong, older brother, you know, and he always protected me to a fault. I mean, was just, you know, <laughs> and, it, and it really gave me this um, sense of security that I, I never even really realized because I always had him. So I always felt safe. Um, and then you know, for him, I think when I was diagnosed, everyone around you feels very out of control. There's nothing they can do. Mm -hmm. And this gave him something he could do. And um, the first donation, he donated bone marrow differently for each, for the first transplant. And then again, the second, and the first one was actually more difficult. It was the peripheral. So he had to go through, it was about a week or 10 days total um, of, you know, sh shots and uncomfortable bone pain and then the donation. And, and he, he never complained and he did it. And I remember the day that they brought his cells in, cause I think they froze him for about two weeks, week and a half. And he was with me the day they brought his cells in. And, you know, oddly through all of this, I think I've only had a few blood transfusions, but I remember in those thinking, this is wild. This is someone else's blood going in my body, you know, but when it was my brother's, it was this feeling of like, oh yeah, bring it on. You know, he's getting ready to, his cells are getting ready to come in and just, they're going to just, they're going to keep me safe. They're going to mm -hmm. do what they need to do. And so it was almost this feeling of he's got me you know, and, and I think that that emotional and mental aspect cannot be overlooked because yeah. I was so sure that that was it. And it, you know, I was so incredibly fortunate. I never had graft versus host disease because my body recognized that? it because we have the same DNA, you know, and, oh, I'm sorry, graft versus host is, um, so, but, really quickly, because I think this is interesting, the way that a bone marrow transplant or stem cell transplant was described to me is, you know, we all have cancer cells. Everybody living has cancer cells. Right. A healthy immune system can red flag it and kill it off. You know, a cancer patient's immune system, and maybe more so for blood cancer, I'm not sure why, but this is just the way it was explained to me with my lymphoma. Mine could not red flag and kill the cancer cells that were in my blood. So, we tried the treatment, obviously it didn't work. So then the curative treatment option is to basically kill my immune system and give me a healthy immune system. So they killed my immune system, went through a few rest days, and then they brought in my brother's stem cells. And it's just a small IV bag, bright red, infused in through my line. And it takes about 10 days to what they call engraft. So his cells finally found their way into my bone marrow. And then they started making his red blood cells and his. So actually we have different blood types, which is fascinating. And then um, the first transplant, I actually only converted halfway to my brother. So they tried to balance my young age with quality of life post-transplant. So they hit me hard, but they didn't hit me all the way hard. So actually after that transplant, I had half my immune system, half his, they, they thought they'd killed mine off because my blood counts were 0, 0.0 for wow. days, but for whatever reason. So it was pretty wild whenever I had blood work done outside of a cancer hospital, it freaked everybody out because they're like, whoa, 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 why are you half this and half this? And, um, so then the second bone marrow transplant, we, that was pretty bad. That was pretty scary. So they had to really hit me hard and they killed me completely off, brought his in. And so today I'm hundred percent, his blood, his, his everything. I have his allergies. I have no, I really kid you not. I have some of his mannerisms that really freak me out. And it really <laughs> freaks my husband out. Cause he's like, Holy, you're your brother. <laughs> 
that. I'm, oh. I know, I know it's wild, but yeah, I mean, I think having him and knowing that that is him and, um, you know, it brings this closeness. I, I choke up when I talk about it because it does, it brings this closeness so that you can't even imagine really. I mean, to be able to, he's literally saved my life twice and my kids yeah. know it. And my kids worship my brother. Hmm. They rightly so. I mean, they, they think yeah. he, um, they know, I mean, they just know, they just know it's, it's pretty incredible. It's extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of and he does not let him. me forget it. <laughs> oh, is that right? <laughs> no, we, we joked about it, but uh, it's, yeah. It's when there's cool. one cookie left, he reminds you who saved your life. <laughs> yeah. That he does. That he does. Yeah, he sounds like a heck of a great guy. Yeah, he is. He is. Oh, my goodness. Very and, cool. Oh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I cannot imagine what yeah. it would be like to have my sister or brother mm -hmm. be able to put their cells, you know, donate their, yeah. Their and you know, I think me. also, you know, we, we, we do a lot of work with be the match because I think when I was going through it, you know, you, you live on the same hospital floor for, you know, six weeks, two months, you, you meet other patients and your family meets their family. And we met way too many patients that were there waiting for a match. And they didn't have a match, you know, because it's it is uncommon to have a, a relative match. It just it unfortunately is. And so I remember at that time thinking, when I when I'm able, I want to help. I don't know how, but I want to do, you know, do something because there is um a, a fear people have around signing up to be a bone marrow donor because it is a process, you know, it just is. But on the flip side, you talk to people that have donated for people they have never met. They may never meet depending on how they agree to do it. And they're fearful and they're nervous, but afterwards, it, you know, once they're able to see the life they saved, I mean, I think that would probably go on their top three accomplishments of their life, you know? And so I was so fortunate to have my brother. And I think, you know, it's a pretty equally amazing experience if you're able to do to be a donor to someone that you've never even met, you know, I mean, you save a life, you literally, literally directly save a life. And there's so many people out there that need those matches. So many. You know, what is coming up for me right now is two things. One is the extraordinary human beings that donate their bone marrow to a person mm -hmm. they've never met and maybe mm -hmm. never will. Mm -hmm. Like those are extraordinary human beings. Mm -hmm. The other thing that comes up for me is like, okay, we're at a place in life, in the world, in the, our culture, where extraordinary human beings are the one who donate their bare, bone marrow. Mm -hmm. It's not a natural, common practice. Mm -hmm. That's right. And not to diminish those who don't, but to just, it just had me imagine a world where it's just, mm -hmm. where people just do it. Like, mm -hmm. what if, what mm -hmm. if people weren't extraordinary for donating their bone marrow? Or what if like mm -hmm. the world was filled with extraordinary people who donated their bone marrow? Because my goodness, to have mm -hmm. my bone marrow save someone's life. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, because I've had cancer once, because I've had cancer twice. I mean, I, I, I can't mm -hmm. donate anything. The only thing I can be, mm -hmm. I can donate is to science. So people can you know, mm -hmm. use my body for whatever they want to use it for. Mm -hmm. But nobody wants mm -hmm. my blood. Nobody wants right. my organs. Nobody wants my right. anything. Right. They don't. Right. Nobody wants to get a transplant and then get my cancer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm. So graft. Versus host disease. That is yeah. when the uh, when when basically there's that's right. Sorry, that's no. It's okay. We're talking one. about Sorry. everything. So We've covered fifty so topics. One of the big the big uh, complications with the bone marrow transplant or stem cell transplant is if you are you know your immune system is killed off, and if you're given someone else's immune system, and it starts to grow in your body, there's a good chance that that immune system is not going to recognize your body. 
right? It's foreign. So right. an immune system attacks a foreign object. So it starts to attack and it could be as mild as a skin rash and it could be fatal. I mean, really it can be, so the dog, that is one of, well, it is the biggest thing that doctors look for. And there are different medications you can use to manage it. They suppress the immune system while it grows to kind of keep it from attacking. And uh, it can be, um, you know, you, you can struggle with it indefinitely. It can be debilitating. And you, that's, you just never know when you go through it. And that is part of the, mm. the, what you sign off, you know, as you agree to do it is, is knowing that. And I, I never even had to take the immunosuppressive medication, which is pretty unheard of, even for people with a related donor. Um, I, I never had to deal with that. I had some other serious complications, but that was one that I never, I never, I never did. And I, I think, I think I was talking about the mental, the mental and emotional component. I think somehow, somewhere my body just welcomed it. And maybe it was, we were good with each other, you know, new immune system, foreign body. It's good. It, it was, it was maybe not foreign. Maybe it was, I don't know. I think there's something to that, you know, just, just having that confidence and, and, um, knowing that, that, that has come to save you and that has come to do what it's meant to do. And, um, I, I, that was one thing I didn't worry as much about going forward. Hmm. Yeah. I, I love that, uh, mm -hmm. point of view, like welcoming it into your body mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah. There's so many yeah. aspects of life that if if mm -hmm. we welcome that which where there could be so much resistance if you welcome it in, mm -hmm. that's gonna change your mm -hmm. relationship to it. Totally. And I, I think like with chemo, I think we all, I mean, tense up, you know, it's oh my God, what is this coming into my body? And it's scary. It's it's terrifying, you know. You know it's coming to help, but you don't know what else it's going to do. And it's unknown and foreign. And so there was something in the midst of all that, having something come in that wasn't unknown and foreign, but it was the most important thing was pretty uh, indescribable. Yeah. And it sounds like it's pretty incredible that your body just accepted the donation. And that was that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it Phenomenal. was. Phenomenal. I think it was. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have some questions. You said it was widespread and it went to your spleen, stomach, and bone marrow. Mm -hmm. Now, were there any surgeries or was it just the chemotherapy? No, we, um, other than the lymph node removal for the diagnosis mm -hmm. and then the port placement, um, it was just the chemo. It was just the chemo. And I assume it's because it was a blood cancer, you know, um, leukemia and lymphoma are always lumped together in the same areas, you know, because it, it's not so much of a, a specific area. It's just in the blood, you know, traveling kind of everywhere. Yeah. So kind of coming from the bone marrow. Mm -hmm. I assume so. I assume so. That's where the blood is made, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And you, th okay. So there was just chemo, but, and you thought you said, you know, way back a while ago that you thought, you're developing your neck muscles mm -hmm. and this has me think like you know the the work you are putting into your body and your wellness oh yeah you mistook mm -hmm. the disease yeah for all the hard work you know the, the results um mm -hmm. wow mm-hmm yeah, I mean, I, I still say today, confidently say, I was in the best, I mean, absolute best shape in my life the day I was diagnosed. 1,000%. Yeah. I had done the Boston Marathon um, eight months prior. I think I'd actually done three marathons that year. And I just kept getting faster and faster and faster. I mean, this was type A. This was, this was you know, <laughs> clearly ath athletic family. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it just, it just kept, and I, you know, I think, I think there was, I think you alluded to this earlier, but when I, I remember also when I was diagnosed, 
you know, there's a lot that comes with it, but, but there was, um, there was a part of me, once I was really able to be honest about this, there was a part of me that was like, oh, okay, I can take a breath. And, um, you know, I remember um, one of my first days at MB Anderson, someone um, offered me a warm blanket and I'd never been offered a warm blanket before. And I remember putting this warm blanket around me and I just remember thinking, I felt like so cared for. And so um, like given permission to be not a uh, superwoman in a way. And, and it just felt like I could just melt into a chair and breathe. And I, I was not giving myself that permission in my life. I mean, I just kept raising the bar and pushing it harder and pushing it harder. And, you know, once those warm blankets started coming, you know, I, I started craving them. I needed those warm blankets and I needed the person who brought me the warm blanket because, you know, again, what we were talking about earlier, I wasn't going to ask my family for that because I was good. I was strong. I would, I don't need a warm blanket. Would you like a warm blanket? But these were people hmm. that were offering me and it was okay to accept it they wanted me to accept it. They needed me to accept it. And I needed to, I needed it, you know? And it was this, almost this like childlike need to just be cared for in that, that space, in that moment, in that way. And I really liked that. I liked that mm. aspect. Does that make sense? I don't know if that sounds crazy, but, um, yeah, I mean, 1,000%. Um, and then it, it, it shifted over the years. I think there were days where, you know, I don't want a warm blanket. I want to be okay. I want to be. And then there were days where, you know, I craved it just as much. And then when I became a mom, I remember, you know, you're always caring for others. And if I had to go back into the hospital, I couldn't get that blanket fast enough. You know, it was someone please care for me, you know, please just, just, just do me for a little bit, you know, cause it's safe to do that here. Oh, that makes so much sense. It makes so much sense. I struggled receiving care mm -hmm. from the nurses. Mm -hmm. you know, the doctors were, were, were very matter of fact, you know, some had a better bedside manner than others, but mm -hmm. accepting the care of the nurses you know, it was such a struggle for me. You know, I'd make a lot of, uh, as I got to know them, I'd, you know, make jokes, you know, like innuendo, sexual innuendos, nothing like, you know, mm -hmm. I, as, as, as I experienced it and as was my intention, I believe this was the case where like, mm -hmm. I wasn't being like vulgar and, mm -hmm. you know, but I was, mm -hmm. I was just being playful. And why mm -hmm. was I doing that? Why was I making jokes, sexual innuendos? Because I was feeling demasculinized by the care mm -hmm. I was receiving. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And to acknowledge that I am feeling beaten or mm -hmm. I am in pain or my pain level is actually this. It's not what I said it was because I did a lot mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm all right. And, mm -hmm. you know, when I was married the first time, my wife was like, uh, you're on, you know, X milligrams of morphine a day and your mm -hmm. pain's at a four right now. Mm -hmm. Like your pain's outrageous. You're not all right. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really took something to take the I mean, each time I was given a warm blanket like you're bringing mm -hmm. this to my attention now I've never looked at it this closely but each time I received the warm blanket mm -hmm. there was a part of me that was like thank you mm -hmm. and another part of me that was afraid mm -hmm. 100%. I, didn't, I didn't want to seem weak yep yep and the care and, and then when I finally gave myself over to it and allowed mm -hmm. myself to receive the care mm -hmm. and to say how I'm really doing, mm -hmm. you know, then there were times and I was like, you know, no warm blanket today. I want to be a little right. cold. I want to tough through this. I want to like, yep. there's something else I need, but yeah. then there was, you know, when the care was over and treatment was done, I was like, okay, there's no more warm blankets. Mm -hmm. like, there's no one asking me how I'm doing every day. It's crickets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, you know, something that I don't 
notice and never heard, never was addressed when I was a patient. Mm -hmm. was like, when you ring that bell and walk away, like, it's going to be crickets. Mm -hmm. And it might be difficult for you. And if yeah. you ever thought about being in a support group, if you're not in one now, it might be a good idea to get in one because there's mm -hmm. going to be this hole. Mm -hmm. where, like, you were cared for around the clock and now it's gone. That was mm -hmm. my experience anyway. And 100%. So, 100%. Yeah. 100%. And I think um, that that is a really hard place to be. I think that it's not that you're asking for um, attention or accolades or anything of that sort. I think you're asking for space to and time to you're, you're not going back into the same life. You're not the same person. It's it, everything's changed. And I always said it was so much easier when I had a bald head because, mm -hmm. you know, when you don't have hair, people just, it's a, this constant reminder of, Oh God, uh, that's right. She's okay. Yes. Yeah. Don't worry. You do not have to come tonight or don't. <laughs> yes. It's fine. I was confident enough to say no regardless, and I didn't need their approval, but just the grace you're given and the space and the kindness. And over the years, you know, you start to look healthier and your hair grows back. And how many doctors have I met, non-cancer doctors, um, dealing with side effects that we're trying to figure out where they say, you look too good to have, you know, whatever you're saying or whatever I'm seeing on this paper. And I'm thinking, well, should I not have showered today? I mean, <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's this weird spot of, um, you know, not being given that compassion and grace where it's like, God damn it, where's my red warm blanket, you know? And, and it's not that we want to live in that and we don't want to live as cancer patients, but we want to take what we have learned and the sort of uh, permission we've given ourselves. And we would just, um, just to have that given back to us in the same way. Yeah. Yeah. That, that mm -hmm. transition mm -hmm. Yeah. into being a different person. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, you know, you don't come out of this, you know, my husband and I were very honest about it. We've totally changed. We've, we've changed so much and we've flipped flop roles, you know, I mean, he's now sort of more the type A ish, you know, planner. And it's the joke. I can't make a plan to save my life. I can't mm -hmm. even tell you what I'm gonna have for lunch today. It's too, too stressful. I don't know. I, I can't decide. <laughs> and he loves to find a sense of control over, you know, well, he's going to save for retirement and that's what he can control. But it's a, I cannot do, I, I can't do that because I don't know if I'm going to be here in retirement. I don't know if any of us are going to be here. You know, God forbid we could get hit by a bus outside. It's not that I live in a pessimistic viewpoint where I think, well, I, you know, my cancer is going to come back and take me. It, it could, um, it, it could it could be any number of things for any of us. I just think what we were saying earlier, once you've experienced that, that life changes on in a minute at a totally unexpected time, it is very it is an, almost it is an impossible thing to ask of me personally to save for the future or delay anything to the future because I want to do it now. I want to live my life now because there is no guarantee. So therefore, how do you balance that in the real world? Because we all still have bills and we still have to be smart and we still have to plan and we still have to save. And it's not this uh, idealistic, you know, live like you are dying mentality of I'm going to just travel the world. And, you know, what about school? What about the kids? What about, you know, so it, for me, at least it's been a really, uh, it's been a daily challenge to try to live every day to the fullest while being honest about the struggles and trying to be smart about the future that I'm just going to assume we all have. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, it's a hard thing for me. It's a really, really hard thing for me. Yeah. I appreciate you saying that I'm, I'm there as well. Mm -hmm. It's uh, 
all of my retirement was cashed in when it came time to not work and get treatment. Treatment laid me out. I couldn't work. I was 36, turned 37 two weeks after I was diagnosed. <clears throat> um, our son was four months old. Mm. And my wife at the time, Daniela, she had a nine-year-old boy that was my stepson. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't work, and she was taking care of the baby and mm -hmm. had a nine-year-old. Like, there, we cashed everything in. Mm -hmm. And now as I'm looking at, then I was diagnosed again, you know, and it's, it's just then this whole recovery emotionally and physically from the whole process. And mm -hmm. I think about that a lot, like, okay, putting away for retirement and at the same time, like, I don't have the sense that I'm going to live a long life. My body's mm -hmm. been through a lot. I've had mm -hmm. two major surgeries cut from my sternum to my pelvic bone. And the second, mm -hmm. the first surgery, I was then cut from the back of my pelvic bone to my tailbone. Mm -hmm. I've had 15 months, 14, 15 months of chemotherapy. I've had five weeks of radiation. I've had mm -hmm. CT scans, like so much of the treatment mm -hmm. and the scans the post-treatment scans also cause cancer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah like and people say oh you know don't be morbid don't be hopeless I'm like oh i'm not you're not being morbid no, no. i'm just being mm -hmm. logical Realistic. and yeah like mm -hmm. i've accepted my mortality and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm not a fool i don't think that when should i be aware of my should i be aware of the you know should i be diagnosed and be you know, become clear that I am going to die. Mm -hmm. uh, should I get to a place? You know, I'm not foolish enough to think that I have that handled. Mm -hmm. I'm saying in the place I am now up mm -hmm. into that point, should it happen? Mm -hmm. I'm clear that that's a absolute possibility. Right. And right. It, it impacts how I live my life. I take mm -hmm. my son, my younger guy, mm -hmm. he and I love to fish. So, you mm -hmm. know, Two summers ago, we went down to my brother's place in Oklahoma and we fished for blue catfish. Mm -hmm. um, caught massive blue cats, you know, just north of, he lived just north of Texas and uh, mm -hmm. I can't mm -hmm. remember where. But um, the year before that, we went to uh, Gloucester, Mass and mm -hmm. we caught sea bass. Yeah. And like, you know, there's, you know, there's certain ways that I live now where it's like, yeah. Yeah. Just bring tears to my eyes. Like, I want to live this life now. I want to connect with my son because I do not know if the next scan I have, they're going to tell me the cancer's back. Right. Treatment's going to happen, and then I might die. Right. And all these opportunities are gone. Like, right. don't be careless about your future, but there's a... Let me just say, I am in the inquiry with you i am also in the inquiry i do not know but yeah. i i do know enough that there's certain ways that i live that you know mm -hmm. I, I no longer spend time with people that i don't love being around correct like yeah. i used to i used to do that as like a courtesy someone invites okay. you it's like well we should go i mean there's still a little bit of that in my life you know but like for the mm -hmm. most part it's like I don't devote myself to things that i don't love and that aren't precious to me because i don't know how much time i have in right. the same breath being connection with others, mm -hmm. being there with people that maybe I wouldn't love to be with at the same time, mm -hmm. that's also a gift mm -hmm. to create connection yep. and yeah. intimacy with others, yeah. if you, regardless of who they are. But, but right. So I guess what I'm saying is there's, there's just more energy and attention given to what really matters what really matters a hundred percent. I remember when my kids were little one day we were living in LA and I think I can't remember how old they were, maybe kindergarten and preschool. And I walked, I think my husband was traveling and I woke them up early one morning on a school morning. It was like a Wednesday. And I said, come on, we're going to go to Disneyland. And they're like, it's a school day. It's a Wednesday. You know, maybe it was first grade. I can't remember. And, and we did that a couple of times and you know, of course it didn't matter. They were so little, you know, what's right. one day of school, but, but it, to them, it was this like, okay, mom's crazy. We already knew that, but, <laughs> but it really was this, it, it was, you know, there were things like that. And I think if we can figure out how to do those things 
in balance in moderation when it makes sense, you know. Um, but I think, you know, that's part of life is just figuring out day to day what what that is. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, after my, yeah, that really speaks to just like, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna have spontaneity in my life. I'm gonna like really I'm gonna, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's because 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 you don't know my uh, former wife and I, you know, we split up in between my diagnoses, and uh, again, like when I got diagnosed a second time. It just, you know, trashed so many beliefs I had. Mm -hmm. And, but one of the things that it did, it really inspired me to create connection with her. Mm -hmm. You know, because my stepson is dear to me and he's been in my life since he was three. And we split up when I was, I don't know, maybe he was 12. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so when I was diagnosed a second time, when it was done, and as I became a spiritual seeker and mm -hmm. took on a meditation practice and just really quieted myself, what was present to me was like that, this is my kid's mom. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, with, with tears running down my face, I'm like, mm -hmm. I married this woman for a reason. You know, I mm -hmm. loved her. And it had, I believe it's part of what had me just do the work and like mm -hmm. a, years of difficult work. And now you know, she's married again and he's a wonderful guy and we're all friends and mm -hmm. now i go up there on saturday nights and mm -hmm. my stepson comes up with his new girlfriend and, like we all play games and have dinner and just have a great time and yeah. i get you know when she ended our marriage she said she was done being married and i was you know furious and then it went to all the you know we didn't do some horrible we we didn't do some horrible you know, law, uh, you know, divorce, you know, lawyers and suing and what I don't know, whatever, whatever it all is that people do. Mm -hmm. We didn't do that. And, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and then I got diagnosed with cancer. So that kind of put everything on pause. But mm -hmm. um, I recognized at one point, I said, thank you for ending our marriage. And she burst into tears. Mm -hmm. She's like, I did the worst job ever. What are you talking about? I'm like, yeah, who in the world would you rather divorce than me? She instantly goes, anybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and started laughing because I'm the most stubbornly loyal person in your life. Like, uh -huh. uh, it's like, you know, uh -huh. leave me alone. I'm good. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm here to support. You know, it's just oh. like with, right. with like, you know, with like with her, you know, I was like that. And yeah, we just were able to I was able to recognize that we were not a good match. Mm hmm. And we didn't know that. And when I went through my first diagnosis, like you want to talk about cancer, just putting a microscope on everything. Like, you know, mm -hmm. we already had issues in our marriage and that just like mm -hmm. put the microscope on it, made it so much worse. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. bringing it back around, like getting diagnosed a second time had me realize like, this is my son's mom. Mm -hmm. You know, I wrote a tune. I, I write, I kind of write outlaw country cowboy yeah. music, I guess. And uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> play with a band, you know, not so much these days, but, That's great. you know, I wrote this tune, like, uh, and the lyrics, you know, it, you know, the, the, the real, the turnaround is like, you know, you are easy to love, like you're hell to hate since you mm. turned around and walked out that door. Wow. So I'm just going to keep on hating you until I don't love you no more. Oh, you know, wow. just like. Yeah, wow. why why did I feel so much hatred? Because I love this woman dearly. Yeah. yeah. And so now, halfway when I first started singing that, I'm like, am I really gonna sing this right now? Yes, I'm so <laughs> glad. That was really did you write you wrote those lyrics? Yeah. That was incredible. Oh, that's thank really you. powerful. Yeah, and and that's what had me, you know, it was that awareness that, you know, and singing that song terrified me. And mm -hmm. playing it for people terrified me. I didn't want anyone to know. You know, like it was some, like, like nobody knew, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That like, you know, why did this hurt so much? Because mm -hmm. I loved her dearly. Mm -hmm. And now with time to heal and a second diagnosis to, to knock me into reality mm -hmm. and to do what matters, I recognize, oh God, we're not a match for each other, but I mm -hmm. love her to death. She's mm -hmm. wonderful. We, mm -hmm. we can talk for hours and hours and hours. We both have very similar interests. Uh, we're both spiritual mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Both have the same silly sense of humor. Like there's mm -hmm. so much about our 
personalities that make us friends. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But we did not do well together with <laughs> to being married. Yeah. yeah. We didn't. And now we get to, to, now I love her like I loved her when I first met her. Yeah. God, what a gift. Oh, my goodness. Like, I'm so yeah. grateful. And yeah. I, I will acknowledge, yeah, it took a huge amount of work. Sure. But I'm grateful for other people in my life who saw, who I saw heal their marriages. So I knew it was possible. And I'm grateful for mm-hmm. every thing in life that had me know in my heart that this can happen if I wanted mm-hmm. to. Mm-hmm. It's pretty mm-hmm. damn humbling. <laughs> That's really, that was incredible. I want to hear you sing some more. Ah, well, I will, uh, <laughs> I'll send you my CD that I recorded. Please like, do. What, 2008, like 12 years ago? And it's longer than, well, it was actually about 12 years ago. I, uh, and, and, and so much going on with the diagnosis and the cancer, yeah. I never got around to recording more music. Yeah. But, uh, you still play, though? You said you still play in a band? Not in a band anymore. I mean, I did a gig in October. We did a socially distanced outdoor gig in October with some guys who I used to play with, and it was fun. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. What, I'm, what I was focusing on before the pandemic hit was doing solo shows, me and my guitar. It was a storyteller performance where I would talk about what inspired me to write the song, like the song mm-hmm. that I just sung for you and everyone listening. Like, mm-hmm. I would talk about how difficult it was to acknowledge that I loved her and she left. Mm-hmm. And how, that the hatred, I mean, God, the word hatred is so terrible. My mom told me when I was a kid, and I said, I hate my brother. She's like, you don't know what that word is. And you really mm-hmm. don't want to know. Mm-hmm. She's like, hey, you can't feel hatred until you've loved someone dearly and you basically don't know what you're saying kid so mm-hmm. don't say that mm-hmm. and it, it still just it doesn't feel good to even say out loud like that i felt hatred like mm-hmm. i had mm-hmm. terrible thoughts mm-hmm. and to and and to to you know and i got all the i got all the agreement from everyone who was in my life like yeah what she did was terrible and you know mm-hmm. she didn't do a good job of leaving our marriage mm-hmm. you know she didn't and mm-hmm. and i get that like she was drowning like she needed to save herself Mm -hmm. that wasn't about me Mm -hmm. as Mm -hmm. much as it impacted me intensely it had nothing to do with me she Mm -hmm. had to other than she needed to get away i mean Mm -hmm. and i wasn't being abusive and i was it was just we just i didn't live my life as the truest expression of me i tamped down my fire and was just embers and Mm -hmm. didn't be who i wanted to be when i was with her Mm -hmm. and i you know she had something similar you know it's just like Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about my marriage, but <laughs> we've been for quite some time. I think this is fascinating, and I think it's honest, and I think I think it's really um, helpful to hear. Well, thank you. So the mm-hmm. performances are, you know, I I talk about the story intimately and openly and vulnerably, and then sing the song. Mm. So, like when you hear the song, you're hearing you you know all the details, and mm. the reason I created this performance it was because someone invited me to do a storyteller performance a few years ago Mm -hmm. but that had me realize wait a second like this is another version of what you and I spoke about earlier it's like am I willing to tell everybody why that song was written Mm -hmm. to bear my soul to these people my shame my embarrassment my insecurities Mm -hmm. and then sing the song so when they hear the song like every word every chord change just makes sense Mm -hmm. I love that thank you so that's what I would like to do once Uh the pandemic is over and I've only done it I only did it three times in like a year and a half because it terrified me yeah yeah I can imagine and I had to do it yes but I was like you know when I had a band that would play in a bar and we'd get what a hundred people in there and it's a little bar and it'd be packed and like you know we're blowing the roof off the place upright Mm -hmm. bass Myself on guitar, a guy playing fiddle, a guy on, a, on either a steel guitar or the electric guitar, mm. and just like blowing the roof off the place. It's yeah. so fun and it's so exciting. People are drinking yeah. and having a blast, but a part yeah. of me was like, trust me, I love this, but mm. there's something else yeah. asking me to go a different direction. And I didn't know what it was, but I knew that I wasn't going to find it unless I let go of what I'd been doing. Mm-hmm. So I stopped and people would ask me why. I'm like, you know, it's like when you follow your intuition, people ask you why. It's like, uh, mm-hmm. I don't really, you know, I stopped you making up reasons. Answer. I used to make up reasons because it was too uncomfortable to not have a real reason. 
right. a, a real reason. I'm like, I right. don't know, but I'm just clear. Right. Like right. Like that this, this isn't the direction I'm going. Right. And right. now what I'm trying to do is just write some more positive songs. I had a, I had a good <laughs> friend. She came to the performance. She, you know, she was like, it was beautiful. She said, I loved it. And I think that some people might get depressed. Because mm. because for me, you know, it's not for me. It's for, you know, lo- I'm aware of the fact that love and grief are one and the same. Mm-hmm. You know, if you love someone dearly, you're going to feel grief because you know that someday you may lose them or they'll lose you. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so to me, in the deepest grief of songs, there's love present, but mm-hmm. I wasn't communicating that in the performance. Mm-hmm. And so that's something I kind of need to craft, maybe mm-hmm. write some more positive tunes. <laughs> 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 to, oh. to lift people up so but it's a work in oh. progress yeah so what do they say sadder than a country song or something like that <laughs> maybe you're in the right <laughs> but people but when we would play the really sad intense songs the next thing you do is you play after a couple of those you play something upbeat and you let people get that yeah. out of their body yeah yeah you know? yeah and in the performance i was doing they would walk out holding it <laughs> i think you know and I mean, people thank me for it, but I just, you know, it was a good friend who knows that she can be really honest with me. And she just said, yeah. you know, it would yeah. be even more powerful if you also brought it around. Right. Well, that, that's fine. So hopefully I'll do that. I want to yeah. hear it. I really, I really do. All right. Well, I'll send you some tunes. I, yeah. I, I said, I'm going to send you my CD. Like that's adorable. Like what year is this? Yeah. I did have all my tunes on yeah. SoundCloud, but send them digitally. But, it's wild that CDs are now antiquated. Right. I know. Yeah, it's a strange thing. When did thing. that happen? <laughs> I know. Uh, My so, kid had never seen a DVD the other day, and I thought, oh, gosh, okay. <laughs> We're just going to skip over that one. <laughs> no, I've got one sitting out. I've got a Neil Young um, live at Massey Hall uh-huh. sitting out that I haven't watched yet. So it was given to me with, with, mm-hmm. the, with, the, with, the, with the album that comes with it. Mm-hmm. I haven't watched it yet. And I'm asking my stepson, I'm like, does an Xbox One play a DVD? Mm-hmm. He's like, mm, yes. <laughs> oh, it does. <laughs> Bar- apparently. Oh. Apparently it does. So I can watch mm-hmm. this. But uh, you said something else that's beautiful and honest and vulnerable. And you said when the cancer came back, mm-hmm. you felt relief. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You felt relief because now you could just do something because you were yeah. in this waiting mode. Yep. Right? Yep. Yeah. Can you say more about that? And the reason I ask is mm-hmm. because I want to know about what the waiting mode. And, but mm-hmm. it's so, it's not a common thing for a person to say they're relieved when the cancer came back. Right. And I get right. it. Right. I, I, I mean, but I also don't get it because I don't know your experience. I'd love yeah. to hear more about that. Well, I think... Um, and to be clear, it was, it was the second time only that I felt the relief. I think that, um, you know, I keep going back to this type A personality, but it it just, it was, it was who I was at the time. And, you know, I wanted answers and I wanted a plan and I wanted to fix it. I just wanted to fix this. And they told me right away, they couldn't fix this. There was no fix. They could help it, but it was going to come back. And I didn't like that answer for so many reasons. So when I went into remission, um, I remember my family celebrated. They were so happy. And um, I remember feeling, I remember sitting on the exam table in the middle of the room and they were around, you know, we got the news. And I think I wrote this at some point. I think I said, I'd never felt so alone because I remember just being in the middle of everyone in this celebration and thinking, why? Or I, I didn't, I didn't get it because it just meant that we were now we were just in the, the waiting period now. And and waiting is hard. And I think when you end treatment, you you lose that sense of I'm doing something. You know, I'm I, I didn't know what to do. I, I did I wasn't in treatment. So this cancer was there somewhere uh, hiding. I had no idea when it was going to come back. So it was impossible to really do a lot of things. And I just wanted to fix it. I just wanted to to get, I just wanted to finish it off, but I couldn't until it came back. 
So it was this, you know, a bad combination of the, my young age, my type A, my, you know, the, the, the unknowing, it was just a lot of um, unknown. And I was, I was not okay sitting in that at all, at all. Um, so when it came back and it was confirmed, it was like, great. Oh, thank God. You know, like, let's get out of this waiting zone and just finish this thing off. Let's just do this. Um, and so it was just this relief of like, we're going to, we're going to put this to bed. We're just going to, if that makes sense, it was, it was the, it was the end in my mind. And I really, really believed, and I, I don't know really what the doctors think they were hopeful I really thought that transplant was the cure. I mean, I really genuinely believed that um, when I got through that, that that was it. And I knew they were still following me and I knew I was always going to, you know, um, be at risk for mainly a secondary cancer coming back. But I really genuinely thought my lymphoma was gone. So the third diagnosis was the polar opposite of relief. I mean, that was, that was the worst day in my life, but, but, um, so I don't know, I guess the relief was just more of just the, you know, finally being able to do something about it. Yeah. You were sitting in limbo. It sounds like, it sounds like you were, you were treading water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I, I don't feel, it sounds like you didn't feel and tell me if I'm wrong. It sounds like you felt like how can I go after my life and create what I want to create when I know that I have cancer treatment coming down the road? 1000%. Yeah. I mean, I could, I, I, there was no way to create any of that really because no one was letting me, well, first of all, the, the maintenance treatments and all that and the time it all took, but there was no way to create any of that. Right. So it's this weird, you're just married. You don't know what to do. You move to this new place and you know, you're looking around and it's like, you, you really don't have a lot going on except to think about it all and, mm. um, get a little, uh, I don't know the word. I don't want to say, you know, again, I mean, I'm, I, I'm so grateful on a million reasons that I found Riley because it was, it was my, the only thing that was able to just let allow me to get out of me and myself and my life and focus on another being and another creature and it healed me to help him and so it just sort of gave me a weird sense of control even though I didn't have any I could see the progress he was making and so it sort of was like a transfer of um you know from me to him of like okay I'm fixing it I'm doing something like you know, I can do something. And, um, you know, it, it, it got me through those months until it came back. I can hear that. Yeah. You, you were being a contribution to another life. Like mm. you, did you have kids at that point? No, no, no you didn't. I, you were newly married. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 So you, we just frozen our embryos because yeah. we knew that was probably going to be a problem. We actually weren't sure if it had already become too, been too late. I think okay. we'd asked about that um, at the very beginning, but again, there'd been no time to even think about it. I mean, I think the answer was, we'll deal with this later. You know, you mm. gotta, so I think that um, they had, they had told us that fertility probably was not an option. And then after my first transplant, they had said that fertility was not an option. Uh Um, And so I was very, very fortunate to have one of my doctors refer me to a fertility specialist downtown Los Angeles. And he wasn't sure. He said he'd do the best he could. And, and, and it, it, it worked. Oh, that's so wonderful. (laughs) Yeah. That's so wonderful. It just sounds like rally was where you got to, devote yourself there was a future you were living into where you your care for riley mattered for riley mm-hmm. rose your mm-hmm. care mattered your presence your being there mattered like there was a mm-hmm. you know um when i got diagnosed the first time and i created my blog mm-hmm. like i told you before we started i began the first treatment with a non-traditional treatment that a lot of folks were interested in and i ended up having followers from you know, all around the world, every continent except wow. Antarctica. And I didn't know 
what I was going to create out of being someone who had cancer. Mm -hmm. Should I live? But something in me just like there was a like something wrong within me that let me know you are going to be a how would how might I say it a you're going to be forwarding the cultural conversation about mm -hmm. cancer if it's individual one on one or if it's with groups like mm -hmm. it's what I'm good at you know and I didn't know where it was going to be I didn't know how but it was mm -hmm. so clear, and I knew that right then my blog was something that was providing something, not just for people who wanted to know the experience, but, you know, mm -hmm. I have a friend whose um, dad had cancer, and his, his mom actually messaged me and said, thank you so much for writing about the emotional struggle and mm -hmm. the difficulties, she said, because my husband never spoke about that mm -hmm. aspect of the diagnosis, about the disease and the treatment. Mm -hmm. And reading yours, like, gives me an idea of what it was mm -hmm. like for him and had her feel more connected to him. It was really beautiful. Wow. So I knew that there was a way that I was going to be a contribution, but that had me really living into the future that I knew I had to have. And mm -hmm. like when I was, uh, when I, this, during my second diagnosis, uh, the first time it was stage two rectal cancer. The second time it was uh, rectal cancer metastasized to my liver. And I was playing with that four piece band, sometimes five, you know, and it's like, and we, we're doing shows I had chemo every two weeks. So we do shows on the off week mm -hmm. when I was feeling great and like going through my chemo, going through my treatment and knowing that in a week I'm going to be on the stage with the band, a crowded bar and just mm -hmm. like blowing the roof off the place, having the time of our lives, mm -hmm. you know, and I sang like I'd never sung before, you know, because mm -hmm. there was more life in me than there'd been since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of, it's so valuable to, I want to say, I don't know if I want to say important because I don't dare, you know, say what another person needs, but there's so much value mm -hmm. in having your life matter while you're going through treatment, mm -hmm. to be living for something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. greater than yourself if if, mm -hmm. if if you're able you know mm -hmm. and it, it, I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of folks who just they go through the treatment they do their thing and here they mm -hmm. are and they're doing well and it's fine but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so let me put it differently just it i can hear the difference it made for you having rally in your life and, you know, yeah. and, and the ways it made a difference for me having certain awareness in my life of there's something mm -hmm. i'm living toward I I, I, yeah. I did a whole lot of talking about what i what could have just been me saying yeah. you know you, Riley's life depended on you, and 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 you yeah. you had to you had to be here. You had to stick around. Yeah, I, I, and I, this may I hope this comes off the right way. I wanted to stick around because of him, mm -hmm. and it's maybe not that I didn't want to be here anymore, but I think there were days. No, I know there were days that that it was. I, it was a lot and it, I felt, you know, I was ready to maybe just consider the, that it, it, it was too much, you know, and I was done fighting because, um, it yeah. absolutely pushed me there many times. And, um, I'd always, whenever I'd go into the hospital for long periods of time, take a, you know, a big like canvas picture of Riley and then when the kids, when I was in with, when the kids were born, I'd have the kids and Riley, you know, I'd always have them up and they, my husband put them kind of over on the window. So I kind of always saw them and, uh, it, it, he, uh, he made me want to keep fighting mm -hmm. because it was bigger than me. You know, it got me out of my, my, me, my, just myself, it was it was bigger than that. You know, we, our journey together was bigger and it was worth the fight. Not that my husband wasn't, not that our marriage wasn't, but you know, it was, it was different. You know, my husband, we love each other to death, but I knew he'd be okay eventually, you know, uh, 
my kids now, you know, I put them in a whole separate category because it, that was so emotional and uh, really hard that, that that's why, you know, I ended up talking about Riley a lot because he's sort of that middle ground. Um, you know, he passed four years ago mm. and I, I say, I always thought Rye would, would, um, I never thought about that day. I tear up every time I talk about it, but, um, I kind of thought he would go on his own terms if I ever imagined it, which I never did because I couldn't imagine life without him, but it was a really tough way that he passed mm -hmm. and he had had emergency surgery and we'd been there about 48 hours and, um, you know, we, he was on life support. I told them, you know, keep do whatever you have to do to keep that dog alive. And he was old and it was time on every level. Everyone around me knew it was time except me. I, I wasn't ready. I mean, I never would have been ready. And yeah. so finally, after about two, two and a half days, um, you know, they had the, they had him hooked up to, to push the, whatever it is that, you know, ends it. And, but it was up to me, you know, to give that, that okay. And, you know, through the years, if I meet people or if I talk to people and if, if they ever use the term, um, you know, God, you're such a hero, you know, it, 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 it jolts me a bit because I say, I, I'm not, you know, I'm a person who was diagnosed and I did what I had to do to live another day. I just did, you know, whatever it was that day, I just did it. There was nothing heroic about that. It, what I did personally, there was nothing heroic about it. But I'll tell you the time I was heroic was that day when I gave mm -hmm. that nod because it was the last thing I wanted to do. But I had to do it, you know. And I think that was really that, that was, that was the time, you know. And I think like a hero has a choice, right? Like Soldiers have a choice to go fight. You know, um, a bone marrow donor has a choice if they become a donor. Those are heroes. They just are. I never had a choice. I just did what I had to do. And, mm -hmm. you know, it it was either going to work or it wasn't. But um, but it was it was that it was that day because, you know, that was the day I had to kind of take that journey just that we had and kind of make it, you know, mine i mean of course now i have two dogs around me as i'm saying all this, mm -hmm. you know? i will always have dogs around you probably hear one snoring down here but but um yeah i think that was it no that's really great people ask you know people say i don't know how you did it i don't know what i would do if i had cancer i say well i certainly don't know but my guess would be is you you do what you always do you'd be mm -hmm. who you are you'd navigate it the way you navigate difficult things yeah. It would just yeah. be way more intense. Like, yeah. 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 And, you know, like we were saying there's so many um, blessings that do come out of it. And it, it is cliche, but it's not, you know, I mean, if I were given the choice, you know, if, if a genie in a bottle popped out and said, you know, I'm going to give you one, not three wishes, one. Do you wish you could go back and never have any of this? I would say, hell no. You know, Agreed. I would go through it all over again. Agreed. And I'd hate to put my family through it again. That's the one thing. But but I personally would do it because I am I this life that I have now is that messy, beautiful life that I think it's more honest, it's more authentic, it's more um, intentional, and it's just it's. You, I feel everything a lot more, you know, I feel the highs and the lows a lot more and I don't ever want to go back to what it was. Mm, I love that. I love yeah. that. I believe that living a true, genuine life, it's messy. Life is messy. Mm -hmm. There's difficult conversations to have. There's mm -hmm. where, you know, like I love, there's a quote that I see every once in a while. It says, you know, um, something along the lines of you know I'm, I'm about to ruin it but it's essentially so i won't even try it's essentially saying you know it's like let yourself tremble when you speak if you must but speak mm. you know it's like that's one of my fears i can't stand mm -hmm. when i'm trembling as i speak because it, it you know in my mind it reveals weakness mm -hmm. and i mm -hmm. finally got into a point in my life now where i'm just like 
You know, the hell with whatever masculinity is supposed to be. I'm going to be me. Mm-hmm. And if I appear masculine to you, great. If I don't appear mm-hmm. masculine to you, great. Because mm-hmm. I know that my mind is judging people all day long just walking down the street. I don't even have to participate. The mind just never stops chattering. You know, it's just mm-hmm. some nonsense we do about where people fit in the category of gender and, you know, mm-hmm. checking the boxes based on all of our baggage and insecurities and, mm-hmm. you know, life mm-hmm. traumas. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so, so, yeah, yeah it's just... Mm. And I feel, I, I don't know, I'd be curious to see what you say, but I feel I've become, um, I've, I've become so non-judgmental and accepting of just humans in general. And I don't know if this is all part of it, but maybe I just respect everyone's life path because I'm kind of asking for the same from them. And so maybe it's this, I kind of now go through life, like I respect you, 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 and you, no matter what that is, you know, and let's just all accept each other. And, and it's this whole thing of, you know, love and acceptance and how, how amazing it is when we can do that for one another, you know, and allow everyone to just be exactly who they are. Cause that gives me a little bit more confidence and security to be who I am because I still struggle with that. And I don't, I think that is, that was not me pre all of this. And I think that's one of my biggest gifts that has been given to me is sort of understanding that and seeing what life is when I live that way. And when I am that way towards others and when I teach my kids about that and uh, the, the, the relationships that we have with others now that I don't know if we would have had before that are some of my most treasured, really and truly. Yeah, I would agree with that. It, uh, mm-hmm. I find that like, the judgment in my mind, the endless commentary that never stops speaking Mm -hmm. still has a still has a presence Mm -hmm. still kind of has its claws in there a little bit Mm -hmm. but I have softened to myself over the years and Mm -hmm. allowed myself to be and not you know judged and you know feeling disgusted with myself for you Mm -hmm. know who I am as a result of, you know, things that happened in my childhood, right? Like Mm -hmm. I've softened to who I am. I've allowed myself to just be open and honest about who I really am. And what's happened as a result Mm -hmm. is I've softened to the world, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. softened to other people. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I, I'm like, I'm quick to judge, Mm -hmm. but then I'm also quick to recognize I'm judging and just drop it. And that yeah. happens more rapidly than it used to. Yes. Because I recognize now that everyone you look at, they're going through something difficult. Yes. Yeah. Or they're completely checked out. <laughs> yes. 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 And, you know, yes. there was a time when there was a righteousness of, for me, within my cancer survivorship, where I was like, I was proud of what I'd done. I was a unique individual. I was someone so few people have been. And then there came a point, you know, where I recognized that that's, I really used that in retrospect, I could see just to, just to, just to carry myself through the fact that it was really hard. But on Mm -hmm. the other side of it, I recognize I'm also not special. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at the world, there's terrible things happening all Mm -hmm. over the world all the time, unspeakable Mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. And if that weren't supposed to be happening, it wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying we can't, I'm not, that's not apathy. That's just recognizing that the the human design clearly includes that, whether we like it or not. Right. And like, there's not much special about me. Right. Um, Right. I I, I had a positive attitude. I, 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 I strive to, to be a contribution even when I was going through my diagnosis, but Mm -hmm. I didn't, Mm -hmm. I didn't decide to be a person who would do that. Mm -hmm. I just got born me Mm -hmm. and got cancer a couple of times. And there are 
billions of people on this planet and far too many of them going through terribly difficult things that yeah. I w- I'm grateful that I only had cancer. Right. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, That's all you had. <laughs> yeah. And but, yeah. I won't pretend that it wasn't traumatic. It wasn't difficult. I am grateful that it happened for what it provided me. Um, but it was difficult and it still affects my life. We spoke briefly before the podcast. You know, you asked me how mm-hmm. I was doing. Um, mm-hmm. And f- for those of you listening right now, uh, today's Tuesday, Wednesday. Today's Wednesday. Mm-hmm. So a week ago, Tuesday, at like five o'clock at night, I having, started having abdominal pain coming and going, getting and worse and worse. By 9 a.m. Wednesday morning, I'm getting ready putting on clean clothes and going to go to the hospital to the ER. And they gave me a CT scan. They found out that I had a blockage in my small bowel. It was an adhesion. I didn't know that you could get an adhesion, which is, if you don't know, it's a uh, scar tissue that develops around small intestine from surgery years ago. It just showed up recently. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was in the hospital for two days, didn't have to have surgery and got to come home and Friday I'm home and my friend, she comes over like she's in my pod. You know, we have a group of people that we see in person and, uh, she walked in and all the emotion just filled me and was literally hitting me from different angles. I wasn't even sure what was happening Mm -hmm. and what was happening is I was getting present to the fact that I had turned off my emotion in preparation for possible emergency surgery. Mm -hmm. One of my previous guests, uh, she was fantastic. She, when she was talking and had me realize, wow, yeah, I never did the warrior thing in cancer, Mm -hmm. except Mm -hmm. for two times when I had to go into surgery. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, turn it off, Mm -hmm. go in because you don't know if you're coming out Mm -hmm. and there's only one way to, for me to step into it. And so Mm -hmm. when I got home on Friday, I was like, wow, like, or when I saw my friend on Friday, I'm like, oh my gosh, like Mm -hmm. it all started flooding me. Like, Mm -hmm. okay, I can turn off the warrior Mm -hmm. calm Mm -hmm. that I was going to step into battle with. And now Mm -hmm. I'm recognizing like, oh, and I also was afraid like, oh no, can I not be one of those people who post-treatment has to get an occasional surgery now and again Mm -hmm. for other bodily issues? Can I please not be one of those people? And Mm -hmm. so as I'm grateful for the diagnosis and how it woke me up, as you so beautifully expressed earlier, Mm -hmm. I'm also really clear that like there are aspects of it that Mm -hmm. I'm not present to. I I didn't realize that I Mm -hmm. could like just be emotionally turned upside down and and, like Mm -hmm. back in it, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. back in the old days of like, Oh my gosh. It wasn't yeah. cancer, but it was like emergency surgery. You don't get to pick your doctor. You don't get to pick your surgeon. You're like, you're doing it right, right. now. And I right. hope, hope you got a good one. And it triggers just, it triggers a lot that, that, um, it's, tr- it can be very fresh, you know, it triggers and mm. it just, you're right there. Yeah. We call it survival mode. You know, when you're just head down, you know, don't think, don't look to the side, just keep going, whatever you have to just, you know do and you know I, I think I became an expert at just numbing out you know yeah, yeah. just n- nothing was happening it was just numb I'm not gonna feel it I'm not gonna you know just head down survival just keep it going it, it has its place mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah it's valuable you know um, mm-hmm. and so so yeah and you'd also said you know having kids like you know me talking about my uh, awareness that I was going to be a contribution in the cancer world and that playing music helped me. You're like, well, what about your son? You had a kid. Mm-hmm. Didn't that inspire you? Mm-hmm. And like what you said, and I was wondering that as I was speaking, I'm like, how come I'm not mentioning my kid? And then you mm-hmm. said it mm-hmm. so well. And I'm like, mm-hmm. yes, that's what it was. It's like, sure, of course I want to be alive for my kid. No question. Mm-hmm. But there's, it's entangled with emotion. Mm-hmm. It's like a it's it's like a rat's nest of wires are mm. all just bound up and nothing is clear. Of course, I, you know, yeah. looking at my kid, that was yeah. that was without question my uh, motivation to stay alive. Mm-hmm. But there was mm-hmm. 
like the day to day didn't always <clears throat> some of the day to day struggles just weren't I wasn't always lifted out of the day to day struggles by the presence of my child and mm -hmm. my stepson. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't. There were times right. where like yeah. it was all so much. Yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, one guy would reach out to me, hey, you know, uh, or may I just say, I won't even give an example, I'll just say something would remind me of the things that I strive for in life and mm -hmm. and and uh, you know. Okay, I got that I got that gig next Friday. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, it's uh I'll, I'll get through this because like you said, sometimes mm -hmm. it's it's so hard. Mm -hmm. And uh mm -hmm. heck after my second diagnosis and I'm like, okay, now that the cancer's over, now I can grieve my marriage ending and like, oh, I have to find a job and like mm -hmm. and be a father and I'm terrified how am I gonna be a father half the time mm -hmm. now that I have to start generating mm -hmm. income. Mm -hmm. I found disability because I due to the cancer and mm -hmm. there were times I was like oh can the cancer just come back mm -hmm. 100% <laughs> well, I, I not... think we want to be our best selves for our kids you know we want to show up and we don't want to mess it up because if we don't if we want to get one thing right in this life it's raising our kids and we don't get a do-over and we're aware every minute of every day of the importance of that and that doesn't stop just because we need time to go through treatment and heal. It all is going to happen at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, I think every cell of our body is so aware of that. And we're so filled with this insane love for these kids yeah. that we have to sort of, it's not that we're not consumed by it. We just can't, it is more complicated. It's way more complicated. And what you just said, I remember the first day I, I was released from the hospital after, I think I was there almost eight weeks for my second transplant. And I was going, um, we, were, we had moved to Houston for about six months. So my, my family was at a house a few miles away from the hospital because we had to, I knew I'd have to go back in every day. And I remember my doctor came in and said, you get to go home today. And I'd been dreaming about this day, right? I hadn't seen my kids, hadn't seen Rye, hadn't, you know. And I, I was, I just, I think I said, are you sure? Like, you don't think I, well, a couple more days, I was terrified. And I went home and I had a two-year-old and a six-month-old. And it was like 30 seconds of this mommy, mommy. And then it was mom, do this, mom, do that. And then, you know, my baby, my boys, my son was six months crying, wanting a bottle, you know, and it was, there was no guy's mom needs to rest. There was, they didn't understand they didn't no. they did they, they 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 couldn't you know and it was I couldn't get back to the hospital fast enough and <laughs> like, yeah. it wasn't for not wanting to be with them I couldn't be with them I physically because it was emotionally draining and kind of heartbreaking for me because I was so far from the mom I wanted to be that I didn't even want to watch that train wreck try you know and I knew I had to give myself grace. And people could say that to me all day long, but it didn't change the fact that I wasn't what I wanted to be for them. It, I just, it was so far from that. So it was, yeah. I mean, it was easier at the hospital and with the warm blankets and, and people caring for you. And I knew that's what I needed. But, you know, again, I didn't want to mess that up. And I didn't want to mess those kids up. And I didn't want... Um, I didn't want them to be scared. And I just, I didn't want that for them. But, you know, here we are 10 years, 11 years later. And, you know, I will say they're the most empathetic little kids that, you know, they're just very, for better or worse, they are, they are, um, they are always very aware of other people's feelings, what other people go through. And I can't help but think that it was related to all of this and just sort of their silver lining if if they learn how to live in this world as an empath you know and 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 manage that i think that could be a beautiful thing yeah that's wonderful my son is also my uh, little guy who's mm -hmm. not so little anymore he's mm -hmm. 14 now he mm -hmm. uh is deeply empathic yeah and yeah I imagine it did you know i honestly never thought about it and uh, it's amazing yeah. what can just 
pass my mind and have me never even catch it, you know. But yeah, like it, I, I'm yeah. so glad you said that because it probably was part of what created him to be who he is. Mm -hmm. He's uh, mm -hmm. he's such a sweet and caring, empathic individual. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm hmm. hmm. There was something I was going to say <laughs> when you said that. Yeah, just the... Reminds me that I had a conversation with my son like in the last week or two. Mm -hmm. I was talking to him about how when he was five and it was his second diagnosis and his mom and I were no longer living together. And she'd bring him over on Saturday because I would get chemo Wednesday through Friday, and Friday at the end of the day, I'd get a shot of something called New Lasta, mm -hmm. okay. which, you familiar with it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've learned recently that, you know, some people take Claritin D, and it makes it less painful. They didn't have mm -hmm. that available in <laughs> 2011 and 12, mm -hmm. at least where I was being seen. Mm -hmm. And they would give me Percocet, but I would be laid out in pain and she'd bring him over, and I'd just be laying in the bed, just like, oh, mm -hmm. my gosh. And feeling terrible as a parent that this mm -hmm. is the father I'm being for my child. Mm -hmm. Well, I asked him a couple of weeks ago, like, do you remember all of that? And he's like, not really, no, mm -hmm. not at all. Mm -hmm. You don't remember Papa being in bed and having a hard time getting food and everything? He's like, no. Mm -hmm. He was playing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. He, 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 yeah. What, and... But yet you are still holding on to it, and we always will. Yeah. But yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It blew me away when I found mm -hmm. out that he didn't even remember it. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, it's people ask, you know, when you talk about having cancer with your kids, you know, how did you do it? I said, you know, same way like when I went to the hospital last week, I called him and let him know. He could hear in my voice that I was clear, that I knew what the options were, and I felt safe and secure, mm -hmm. and I didn't have any concerns about getting to the other side of it mm -hmm. so he was calm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when i yeah. had cancer my stepson said you know can you die from cancer i said you can mm -hmm. said, i don't think i'm going to yeah you know i i uh if it got to a different place i'd have that conversation with him but i find yeah. that you know yeah. they they tune in to how we're responding to a situation and they follow suit yes yeah i i agree i when i was uh, diagnosed when the kids were, um, uh, well, well, my third time, Tommy was five weeks and Ellie was two. And, you know, aside from dealing with the shock of this third diagnosis that I really never saw coming, I, of course, at that point being a parent, you know, I'm thinking, how do I do this with these kids? And obviously Tommy was so little that wasn't, you know, I mean, yeah. he was weeks old, but Ellie, I knew was at this age where, um, I, I knew enough to know this wasn't going to be a couple months. This was going to be something that I needed to know how to navigate as a parent. And I was given this gift of a friend had just said, look, I've got an appointment with you for you with the child psychologist that I love. Just go and one time ask her how to do this and just go with what she says. And um, it was the biggest gift because she had just said, never lie to them you know, hmm. because when the second they feel you're hiding something, that's when they start to lose a little trust, which develops this anxiety. And even though Ellie is young, if you just sort of start this now over the years, you know, they are going to trust you and they're going to trust their dad. They're going to trust the, the grownups around them, but if they have a question, they're going to get a good answer and do it in an age appropriate way. Of course, you know, um, right. And so she gave us guidance on sort of what, what words to say and how to say it. And, you know, big, big, big germ bug, not like a little germ bug that, mm -hmm. that you know, that causes a fever, you know, cause don't worry, you know, that we wanted them to know if they were sick, they weren't going <laughs> to, and we, <laughs> but, you know, yeah. listen, we had some serious issues we had to work through with, with, um, with Ellie over the years. And, um, they had said to take her with me when I shaved my head. Because as soon as my hair started falling out, I always yeah. like to just shave it. And I shaved my head in front of control. my kid too. Yeah, and it's, it's just, it was nice. I understood the reasoning and I would do it again. I think um, it was obviously one of those things for Ellie. 
I don't know if I asked her today if she'd remember it, but she is still funny with her hair. You know, she's still funny with medicine. We, there are things that she's able to, the older she gets, really talk, talk about it and vocalize it. But I will say for all the things I did wrong, the one thing I did, I think maybe I did right because of this, this guidance was to be honest with them. And I do think there is this trust, which helps them trust. If I call like you, I I'm going to the hospital or this is happening. They're able to say, ask any questions they need to ask and then say, all right, cool. You know, maybe they're worried of sure, you know, but, but not worried as in what else is going on. And, 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 uh, you know, I think there's a, um, there's a lot to that, um, that trust that you, you can really depend on. They can depend on. I agree. I always wanted my son to be tuned into his intuition. Mm -hmm. Um, I became an adult, as I said earlier, and learned to discover what my intuition was Mm -hmm. to, to notice like, wow, it's a lot stronger than I ever imagined. I just wasn't present to it. Something I Mm -hmm. grew up to ignore. I asked his mom very early on, you know, I told her his mom very early on, my, uh, my, my wish is that we be honest with him about whatever he asks about, because Mm -hmm. he'll tune in to if we're not being honest. Mm -hmm. And when he's little, that little, we are superheroes. Mm -hmm. And he's going to go with what we say, even if it doesn't feel right. You know, Mm -hmm. may very well assume that he's the one who's wrong. Mm -hmm. So when my son would ask me, you know, why is the sky blue question? And I'm driving and we got to get groceries. And there's three things I'm trying to do while we're driving. You know, I mean, just in my mind trying to sort out. Mm -hmm. I would say to him, kiddo, I love that question and I will answer it. And right now, Papa is really busy thinking about how we're going to do all the things we have to do. Mm-hmm. He'd say, okay, but I, n- I was committed to never lying to him, even mm-hmm. with soft, you know, mm-hmm. what seemed like irrelevant lies, because I wanted his intuition. Mm-hmm. I wanted him to always know, like, mm-hmm. that what he sensed was accurate. That's accurate. That's, I've never thought about it that way. That's, that's yes. Yeah. I, and either I knew I was going to have an intuitive kid, Mm-hmm. Or what I did worked. <laughs> but he is a <laughs> deeply intuitive little dude. He makes me seem like a moron when it comes to my intuition. <laughs> I mean, like, I, no, I learned from him. He's, yeah. he's really something else like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, both the boys yeah. are super, uh, super, um, they can really tune into people, you know. One's my yeah. kid and one's not. But they're both, you know, so I guess I'll give all the credit to their mom because yeah. they both, you know, they're able to do that. They're really yeah. sharp. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you had a third diagnosis. What were you diagnosed yeah. with and how did they discover that? Uh, that was um, the same. It was the same cancer the whole time. Um, okay. That was three and a half years after my first transplant. Um, and so, yep, my daughter was two. My son was five weeks. And I remember during his pregnancy, um, I had back pain, but it was pretty normal to have back pain. And obviously when you're pregnant, you can't be scanned. Um, so I think I've gone almost a year without the scan. Uh, but no one was, we just really weren't worried. It just, it just, it really wasn't. I, I knew the doctors would check me out at some point, like they have been. Um, but he was born and I think it was just, as a couple of weeks went by and sort of that pregnancy belly started to fade. Um, that's yeah. Five weeks. I looked down and I saw the, the lumps like on the, like on my bikini line area. And that's where, in you know, the first two, once I knew that's actually how I found it. Um, the second time it came back is I could see the raised lymph node. Once I knew what to look for, I realized pretty quickly, you know, what that meant. And so when I saw that, I mean, I just, I, you know, I mean, I knew, you know, you, you know, mm. at that point. And uh, I was, we were still living in LA and texted my doctor at um, City of Hope and he said to come straight out. So I drove straight to his office. He did a CT scan and next day called it had, the cancer had wrapped around my spine during that pregnancy. And mm. so, um, 
the big fear was that it was starting to infuse into my spinal column. And so they started chemo, I think like three days later, maybe. And that was, um, I think I'd flown, I think I flew to MB Anderson in between. It was all so fast. And my mom was staying with the kids while my husband and I were figuring out the treatment plan. So we had a plan. We were going to do chemo in LA for a few months and then fly back to MB Anderson, move everyone to Houston um, to do a second bone marrow transplant. And we were lucky because, you know, when, when I first heard this at all come back, the first thing in my mind is like, I don't have another option. Like I've already done this transplant. I've already done the potentially curative treatment. And I knew my body couldn't handle much more chemo. And so there was a clinical trial that my doctor at MD Anderson, I think there were 68 total and I was number 66. So he was able to get me into this. And they had combined protocols from Johns Hopkins, Fred Hutchin and MD Anderson. And it was a pre-transplant protocol from one, an actual transplant protocol from another. And then they interestingly gave me, I think three or four rest days after the transplant. And then they were gonna do post-transplant chemo, which sounded crazy because I thought we well, were gonna kill off the, you know, the cells you just put in, but it, but it, they had a method to their madness. And um, I think it was a 40% mortality rate with that transplant, but it was, it was, it was truly our only option. So that's what we agreed to do. And so I think we did, um, I think it was January through May of chemo in LA. And it was a lot harder on me than we had anticipated. And, um, I had a developed a uh, double pneumonia in my lungs, but I needed to get to Houston because they decided to bump up the transplant because I just couldn't physically handle anything, any more chemo. Um, my body was starting to kind of shut down. So they had to figure out a way to get me from the hospital in LA to the hospital in Houston. And so that was, that was, and to pack up um, two babies, everything you need for five months, a dog, you know, <laughs> it was like, oh and so that was one, that was, that was, that was a, uh, quite a feat of trying to figure all that out. And uh, the they ended up having to send a plane for us where they could put me on the bed on the plane. And it was it was pretty, pretty scary. So I went straight into the hospital in Houston and, and um, my brother donated. He donated that time. He actually went into the OR and um, they drilled. I think they went about 50 or 60 times through his hips to extract the bone marrow. 50 or 60? Mm -hmm. yeah. These are, must be really fine needles. Uh, they are, you know, I mean, he was sound asleep. General anesthesia, he was out. Sweet. Um, you know, it's it's sort of what um, they'll do with bone marrow aspirations, biopsies. You know, I've had, I think I've had in my life probably upwards of 40, but they, they only do one per side. You know, he had 50-ish, 60-ish. The needles are... If I have one per side, I'm sore the next day. You know, it's not awful, but I feel it. I can't imagine what he felt, but you know, he's tough. He's a big guy. And he really likes to pretend like he's really tough, you know? <laughs> and um, he came up after the surgery and he I asked him how he felt. And he's like, oh, I feel great. And I thought, oh God, he's still on all the, the, the meds. You know, right. <laughs> he yeah, totally exactly. wears off. And he, uh, he was sore. He was definitely sore, but you know, it was just the whole thing was so different in the way they were trying to attack this, this, uh, treatment and, um, in an effort to, to really, you know, have it be successful this time. And, um, so I think I was in that, I think I was inpatient about two months. The, mm, um, wow. It's a long time in the hospital. Yeah, it was, it was a very long time. And I think that was the time that I remember being in in pain that that my memory of that time was pain just really you know the the chemo was so um i mean i thought i knew kind of what to expect after having done this before but i just i never i i couldn't have imagined i mean it was it ate um holes through my esophagus and so if i the chemo grew up, which i did often you know the blood would be coming through and just the 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 pain, I mean, it was just pain. Everything was just pain. 
the chemo and, ate holes through your esophagus? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it pretty much, uh, to this day, it, it kind of destroyed the inner lining of my body. So from the way they've explained it in my sinuses, stomach, it really, anything that has kind of an inner lining, it, it ate it away. So the side effects I deal with today are sort of all related to that. Um, and you know, it's not something for whatever reason can regrow, I guess the way the chemo kills it. And, uh, you know, I think with the pain aspect, they ended up putting me on a drip, a pain med drip at some point. And, um, that was a hard thing for me because it, when you're on that for so long, I mean, I think they put me on that probably on week two, you know, your body really, um, it changes the tolerance and the effectiveness of all these medications. And I kind of got to the point where I knew, um, you know, after I was discharged that it, when I was in pain, but it was almost like, I felt like it was being questioned sometimes, or it was a very interesting thing that I'd never thought about or really, um, it was, that was a, a hard thing for me because I felt like but people weren't believing me almost, or I felt like, you know, um, it, it just wasn't thing I was prepared for on the flip side, if that makes any sense. You know, if I said I was in pain and to have people doubt that or not, you know, think I was in pain for the wrong reasons or that was, that was really hard for me. Um, what had them doubt you? Well, I think the, the, you know, I, I was kind of saying earlier, people like, God, you look too good, you know, to, to be a three time, you know, whatever all right. this is. And, yeah. and I think it was, I had one doctor say, well, I can't see that you're in pain. You know, if I had an x-ray and you had a broken leg, I could see that, but I can't see what you're telling me. And what he didn't say was, so therefore I don't believe you, you know, and it was just sort of that, um, and by this was not at MD Anderson, by the way, it was, it was, you know, when you go different places where they don't know you and things like that, you know, it, it was hard. And I kind of felt like I had to keep like carrying around like my medical file or my cancer mm. file of this, like, you know, if you want to look, you can see it, but it, 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 over the years has become this odd thing that I, it's like, I don't want to have to justify this, or I don't want to have to explain this, or I don't, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be in pain, but I am. So, you know, and maybe, um, I don't, I, you know, so I don't know. I think it's just been this, this journey from all of it in the extreme, uh, I don't want to say damage the chemo did the extreme, um, power that it had on my cancer, which worked, but then also on, on the, on your body, you know, it can't differentiate good from bad. It just kills what it's meant to kill. Um, and you know, how that plays out for cancer patients afterwards, I think is, um, you know, different for all of us, but, but significant. Yeah. So you, still have pain at times currently? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 100%. Yeah. And it's, um, I guess you could say unexplained. Um, and so we've kind of gone from specialist to specialist and sort of, I'll have one stick with me for a while and then they'll kind of refer me on to another. And it's been this for a while. Um, and when I'm in it, you know, it's this, oh my gosh, I've got it. Why is this happening? And then you kind of feel better and recover and you get back into life and you think, oh, I'll figure it out later. You know, you just get so tired of kind of, um, you know, managing it or being quote unquote sick. You know, you just want to kind of live your life. Um, and, and you get discouraged, I think too, you know, I mean, I think not mm -hmm. just with cancer, there are so many, you know, things that that are unexplained that people deal with health wise, you know, why is that happening or what is this? And right. it's a really hard thing to go into a doctor and explain what's going on and have them say, I don't know, or kind of in not so many words, like, I don't believe you, not that I don't believe you, but just basically shrug their shoulders. I don't know. There's no diagnosis. You know, I can't put a label on this. So therefore, um, 
you know, why don't you go see so-and-so maybe they can help you, you know, and it, you kind of then go see that person and you repeat the whole background and your story and all of this. And so it, you know, I think, I think, you know, again, not just with cancer, I think this happens and it can be really, um, it can be really hard and it can wear people down and, and, you know, I've tried a lot of holistic doctors and I love them and it has helped me immensely Good. And I've learned so much. And so, you know, I love that idea of prevention and building your body up as much as you can to keep it, you know, as strong as you can. And I believe in that. But then when the pain comes, there's no denying that either. So it's how do you merge the two and sort of manage it all while living a quote unquote healthy life? without being under that cancer patient, you know, protective umbrella of actively being in treatment. Yeah, I know just what you mean. I had a pulmonary embolism after the first cancer treatment, uh, I imagine in response to, as a result of the chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And it took them a while to find it until they finally Mm -hmm. called me. They finally gave me a CT scan and they call me when I'm home. They're like, "Uh, we need you to come back. I'm like, okay, when? Like, right now. Mm -hmm. I need to get these shots in me so it can like mm-hmm. have my blood not coagulate as well. And, mm-hmm. and so, you know, cause it was, for those who are listening, a pulmonary embolism is a blood clot between your heart and lung. Very, very dangerous. And so that was dealt with. And then after treatment was over, I was tired doing anything mm-hmm. and everything. Just mm-hmm. so fatigued. And I figured it might've been from chemo, but then it just kept going on and on till Finally, I told my oncologist, or my yeah, my oncologist, and I get referred to a cardiologist. Mm-hmm. Cardiologist says, "Well, I don't see anything. Your heart's good." And I'm sitting there, and then he's like, "Ready to go?" I'm like, "No." Like, so if you don't see anything, okay, got it. So if you were in my shoe, you know, who, who should I go see? You know, he's like, well, you could do this. You could do that. I said, well, if it was you when you were fatigued and it wasn't your heart, where would you go next? He said, I'd go to a pulmonologist. I said, great. Mm-hmm. Is there a pulmonologist here? Yes, there is. Good, great. And I get a referral. And I see the pulmonologist. He says, we don't see anything. So then they send me off to see, maybe it's back to cardiology to get a heart ultrasound. And, oh, we didn't find anything. Mm-hmm. And then there's the silence. And I'm like, okay. And Mm -hmm. what do you recommend I go do? Well, you probably want to go back to the pulmonologist. I'm just like, you know, Mm -hmm. we all learn you have to advocate Mm -hmm. for yourself because Mm -hmm. I've only had one doctor in my life. It's Dr. Kemeny down at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Mm -hmm. And when I went into the hospital last week, I just got a call from one of her nurses yesterday. She's like, why didn't you call us? Mm -hmm. I said, easy, tiger. I said, (laughs) (laughs) I made some smart remark and got her to laugh because they, you know, but then I was like, you know, my doctor. The, you know, the doctor who was overseeing me, the hospitalist, he said that if I didn't hear, if they, it would take, take some time to get the info to you. And if I didn't hear from you in a week to let you know, mm-hmm. but they called me the minute they got it. And she said, Dr. Kemeny, she said, she wanted me to call you immediately. She wanted to make sure you're okay and know what had happened. Mm-hmm. And when I went there uh, a year ago, two years ago, maybe two years ago, I was taking saw palmetto because, you know, for uh, for urinary ratio, you know, like I pee and then I'd leave the bathroom, like, oh great, I there's still some left, you know, I just dribbled, you know, like, mm-hmm. so she's like, no, you're too young for that. I want you to go see a urologist. I'm like, okay. Two weeks later, I get a phone call from one of her staff. Hi, this is Abby from Dr. Kemeny's office. She wanted me to call and see if you'd made an appointment with the urologist yet. Like she is on top of everything. Mm-hmm. Never had a doctor like that in my life. So eventually. I got back to this, going back to the other story, I got back to this pulmonologist and she finally put me in a, gave me a test that is used on like astronauts and Olympic athletes. They put you on a bicycle. They, they have this device that you're holding in your mouth. It's that you're breathing into. It's measuring the pressure going in. It's measuring the pressure going out. They're watching my heart. And after all this, after that final treatment and she was able to say to me, okay, you have no heart issues. You have no lung issues. So what you have is a systemic atrophy. Your body has simply acclimated to your sedentary life. And I recommend you go to a physical therapist and you get your body back in shape. 
But Caroline, it took like so much effort on my part. And they just want like, you know, so many yeah. docs just like wash their hands of it and said I did my job. And I'm like, no, yeah. you didn't do the last part of your job. Tell me where to go. Right. And you said you went to MD Anderson and what was the other place? City of Hope. City of Hope. But there was another place, um, maybe it was MD Anderson. But mm -hmm. if they treat people for the cancer mm -hmm. you have, don't mm -hmm. they have folks who are available to treat you for the the impact that the mm. chemo's had on your body? They tried. They tried. They absolutely tried. I think at the end of the day, the answer that I heard and that I still hear is you're an unusual case, you know, because it, it always goes back to we usually don't see people you, with, you're so young, you know, with what you've gone through. And we usually don't see this side effect, but it was also a clinical trial and there weren't a lot of us. So it's a, it's a, um, they're learning along with okay. me. So there's not a, um, it's not that they haven't tried. And I think it got to the point where, you know, then it was, we'll go see, um, I found a great doctor at UCLA that really helped um, I was, we were both very hopeful and not from what he, he stuck with me longer than most. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, it just, you know, um, I think I believe deep down it's, it's not one problem. I think it's probably, you know, uh, immune related along with other, maybe, you know, several components. And so, you know, it's just, how do I find that, 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 that medical team, from different specialties that's really willing to collaborate and work together and um, that are also really great at what they do. So I actually was going to go to the Mayo Clinic um, just before COVID hit. And then, um, you know, I kind of put all that on the back burner until I was able to fly and travel. But I think that might something like that, just where it's more of a collaboration and, and yeah. um, you know, and, you know, my husband and I say this all the time, you know, we are, we're, we're fortunate in that we're able to go see these doctors and we're able to, you know, have the health and energy to, to advocate for, our, for ourselves. But, you know, there are a lot of people that are not, and it's just, you know, it's, you really realize, um, you know, I think, I think a lot of doctors, I think most doctors do a great job and do the best they can. But I was with one of my doctors that I have now the other day, and he just went through a personal situation where one of his family members has been in the ICU for a while. And he was tired and he was run down. And I knew it when I saw him, something was wrong. And he sort of tell, he told me about it, just opened up. And, you know, I'm listening to his story and he, he finished and he just said, I, if there's any good that came out of this, I now have a better understanding of what my patients go through. You know, and, and it was, it really was this feeling of, of, uh, you know, the empathy he gained, unfortunately, is, uh, is going to, is going to benefit his patients just in the bedside manner and the time he spent. And, you know, he gave me more time that day than he's ever given me just after his experience. And I think doctors do a great job, but sometimes they just don't realize, you know, that, that it's what it puts back on our shoulders when sometimes we're not able to bear that when we're actively sick, going through treatment, whatever it is, you know, in the trenches in that survival mode, you know, we have to put our trust in them and we have to trust that what is being said, decided the plan is going to work. And there's that aspect, but then there's also the emotional component where, you know, we need them to be, uh, we need to be able to put our trust in them. Yeah, they treat us from knowledge mm -hmm. and experience observing the symptoms or the disease, but not all of them treat us with empathy mm -hmm. and, oh, and an ability to understand what you're going through. Right. Even as simple as the medications. Mm -hmm. I was on morphine last week and I was on morphine for my, you know, for my, uh, uh, pain from my first diagnosis and like 
how many of those docs have ever been on morphine? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, how many of them have ever gotten certain treatments? It's a, you know, they, you know, and you're grateful that they haven't, mm-hmm. right. but they're, you know, they can't empathize with what you're going through. And it, and it sounds like it's wonderful. Like your doc was like, okay, wow. Yeah. I have a different relationship with my patients now. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I also have to say, I've had two main oncologists in my life, one at City of Hope and one at MD Anderson. And I think they are both two, I think, I think they are angels sent to me from above because they are so um, phenomenal, not just in their, you know, brilliance and medical decision making. And, and I trust them, be, I mean, 1000% with, with that. But I think that the reason that I, I genuinely love them so much um, is because they are two doctors through all of this. And you and I were talking earlier, and, you know, there's always a little bit of ego that comes in with, with a doctor. I mean, my dad's a doctor. I get it. I see it. Um, but I think it's the doctor that is able to to put the ego down for a minute and have that human moment. And, um, you know, my doctor in in Los Angeles, oddly, he lived a couple of miles away and some nights, um, he would, he would drive by our house on the way to his house. And if he ever got off early, a lot of times we were in the front yard with the kids, Riley, you know, Riley loved chasing tennis balls. And there was a, one night when I walked out and I saw him standing in the yard with Riley throwing tennis balls and just the kid, he was laughing with the kids and, and he would started just stopping sometimes and just saying hi to the kids and throwing the balls, you know, hi, hi, how are you? And then he'd kind of keep driving home. And, and I, for a while, I kind of thought, is that odd? And then I kind of really thought about it and I thought, he does this because I have to think during his day, you know, I can't begin to imagine what these doctors go through with the patients they lose, you know, the decisions they shoulder, these incredible, you know, it is life or death situation that is, that is their day. And I have to think that, you know, if he's driving home and here's his patient who's doing well, right? I'm doing great, I'm doing really well. And he sees these two kids that have a mom, right? And this crazy dog. And I think that it reminded him, this is why I do what I do. And I just, you know, but he wasn't scared to just let that, whether it was vulnerability or that need for the uh, uh, reminder show. And it, you know, my kids thought it was totally normal. Like, oh, Dr. Foreman's here, like a playmate, you know, and he's this... (laughs) world renowned oncologist and it was it became normal to them and my doctor MD Anderson you know we had a moment I've known him this throughout the whole thing I mean gosh going on 18 years and he um had seen my son when he was uh two months I guess and then we didn't take them back to the hospital or clinic area just because of germs for the the cancer patients but we brought him with us when Tommy was, I think, seven or eight. And um, Tommy, my son, had a football. And we had a very long appointment, which we always did, because at that point, I was only seeing him once or twice a year. And it was Friday, and it was starting to get dark outside. And we walked out, and we were in the hallway of the clinic area. And it was, you know, empty. I mean, everyone was gone, long gone, Friday evening. And my doctor was talking to Tommy, and he's just like, hey, let's throw this football. And, you know, we sat there for a half hour and they're throwing spirals down the hallway. With <laughs> Anderson. And, you know, I just had this moment where I'm looking at them and I'm looking behind me out, you know, at the Houston Med Center skyline. And I'm thinking, you know, he, he could be going home. He, most doctors are in their car. You know, they give their patient a half hour. He gave us two hours in clinic and he's still sitting here throwing this football with my son. And I know he's tired and I know he wants to get home. But I think that was another moment where they just need, it's this, this was my patient and I made hard decisions and she's here and this little boy has this mom and they're happy and they're healthy. And, um, you know, that's the stuff that, that 
I think makes a great doctor an incredible doctor. And when you find it, it's so rare that you just, you know, it means everything, you know, it, it, it means everything to us on the patient side. Um, and it's something we'll never forget, ever forget. Well, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. And I, it sounds like you're dead on that he's so happy that you're doing well and he's seeing you raising your kids and you got this sweet dog and yeah yeah to be connected to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a person whose uh experience has overall gone really well yeah my yeah. doctor nancy kemeny she doesn't uh you don't see her smile you don't see mm -hmm. her smile but now that i'm cancer free when i mm -hmm. see her she smiles Mm. I, oh I, my gosh like i saw a big smile on her face today she told me like you're all set you're cancer free uh because oh they did gosh. the surgery then seven months six and a half seven months of chemo and they do the uh -huh. scan she's okay you can go and like she my buddy brought me down there we we're gonna spend the day in new york you know and uh he gave me a hug, and then I, I noticed, like, she just had a smile on her face. And then when she'd see me every few months, she'd be smiling. And it's like, she's the doc who deals with people who have so many... She only deals with people who have colorectal metastasis to the liver. Mm. If you don't have that, she doesn't see you. Mm -hmm, and she has mm -hmm. tons of patients, and she often isn't accepting patients. And these are patients whose metastasis, like, she she can't... The surgeon she works with, Dr. D'Angelica, you know, he's not able to get them all out. Mm -hmm. And so she has to do the treatment that she can do. What am I trying to say? And so she's working with patients who have, who are, who are at far greater risk mm -hmm. of having the cancer get the best of them. Mm -hmm. And so when she gets to have a patient who is just cancer free mm -hmm. and in the mm -hmm. clear, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not that, only it's everything, I think it's just this, like, you know, they, I think they have to be reminded that it's worth it all worth yeah. what they go through mm -hmm. and your energy and who you are mm -hmm. and how you approach life. I mean, it's just, you know, you, you bring joy to me as we have these conversations about really difficult things. And I'm sure you bring joy to him as well. And you, you success and, uh, Sure, it's inspiring to have you around. I love that he's stopping and throw the ball for the dog. That's so sweet. I know. Oh. He's heard me tell that story when I was speaking to a group one time, and he uh, he's so humble. You know, he just everyone looks, and he just kind of puts his hat down. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's so, so funny. Uh, it sounds like that with that what your doctors did with the third diagnosis, this clinical trial. It sounds like what they're saying is we found a treatment mm -hmm. that worked for you mm -hmm. and we're really clear we don't have anything for the side effects mm -hmm. we don't have anything for these permanent side effects and like mm -hmm. it's it's the reality of where they are mm -hmm. like there's mm -hmm. plenty of chemos out there that just wreak havoc on people's bodies right there's a guy in my colorectal cancer support group who's got like a neuropathy in his hands and feet it's like I was talking to him about what I, you know, I, was, yeah, I take milk thistle, you know, to try to reduce the neuropathy. And then, like, mm -hmm. he explains to me that the, like, the pain is, like, it's not mm -hmm. neuropathy. It's not, like, numbness. It's, like, intense pain in his hands and feet that he has to take medication for mm -hmm. that causes him to have tinnitus. Mm -hmm. It's, like, really difficult side effects. Mm -hmm. And the docs are like, well, you know, not in a dismissive way, but we, we figured out a way to save your life. Mm -hmm. We, right. We don't know how to treat the the re, right. how it impacted your body, and we right. want to, and we really want to, and right. We don't know what to we do. We don't know, and you know, I think that's exactly it. And I think that there's only so much of them to devote to the research and the mm -hmm. patient care, and you know, I do understand that. I I don't. It's impossible to be an expert on all of it, right? And um, that's where I think the gap happens, where it's understandable, but there's still a gap, right? So how do you, 
where's, how's that bridged and how is that, you know, um, managed, I guess, when, especially if we were saying when people are actively, you know, going through it and it's a really hard time for them to, to, to do it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, again, it's like you said, it's part of the work that they do. Mm-hmm. It's they're, they're, they're in a field where, like, a significant number of people die from the mm-hmm. disease. Mm-hmm. Like, they're, they're bringing out everything they can yeah. to try to treat people. And uh, it's a heck yeah. of a field to be in. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine. Oh. Cannot imagine. So how long have you been cancer-free now? Uh, ten Ten and a half years. Uh-huh. Yeah, this past July, we celebrated 10 years. Wow, 10 yeah. in July. Congratulations. Thank you. I Thank am. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll be at 10. You know, should I be so blessed? I'll be at 10 years cancer-free next October 28th. Wow. <laughs> you will be. I know you will be. Oh. I know you will be. That is amazing. 10 years is a big one. That, yeah. I mean, that is a big one. That is a big one. It is. I'm happy for you. Congratulations. Yeah. What an amazing thing to be told. Thank you. Three diagnoses. And, you know, it's been such a joy speaking to a kindred spirit. Yeah. Really I know, has. I feel the same. Yeah. And I, I thank you so much for uh, giving all of us your time. Everyone is thank listening you. and me. So I thank want you. you, before we go, though, you're welcome. You're so welcome. I, I love this conversation with you. Yeah. But I'd like you to tell everyone about DearRallyRose.com and mm-hmm. what you do because you are mm-hmm. a resource to many. Thank and you. It might be a little slow during COVID, right, maybe? Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. I think um, I've had more people reach out during COVID, which I've loved. Um, you're, you know, I'm, I love hearing from anyone. I love talking to people, email, um, phone, um, and you can sign up. I send out, um, I don't know, every week, two weeks, three weeks, depending, um, a blog that'll go out that is, um, it's always kind of fun, kind of different. Good. I signed and, up for it yesterday. Oh, great. Thank you. And then you. the book should be coming out hopefully soon. So, oh, it hasn't um, been printed yet. It has not yet. It's in, it's, uh, it's, it's happening. So it's very exciting, but, uh, if you sign up, then it'll, you'll be sure to get the updates. As it oh goes. my so, goodness. Yeah. It's very exciting. It's had a really, um, uh, amazing response, which, uh, you know, I didn't know how that would go. This was something obviously that was so personal and showing it to people, you know, so outside of my life and my, my comfort zone. And, um, uh, I think it was just the, the universal message of hope that really resonated. And so I think it's a very good time, you know, uh, for that in this world. And so, yeah, so you, you'll be able to find it all there and I'll, I'll oh, keep it's everyone exciting. It. And yeah. I acknowledge, I acknowledge yeah. you for writing a book because not only can I not imagine, but when I've thought of writing a book, it's uh-huh. like, I'm, I might as well be, well, look, I'm, I, I'll tell you what, I might as well be uh, trying to, you know, climb Mount Kilimanjaro, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's, oh it, I look at the I think about writing a book and I'm asleep, and I literally think yeah right like uh-huh. it's just maybe this is my book you know maybe the podcast yeah, yeah. because it's I, yeah. I, I, I love that you found whatever it took yeah. to write it and to keep it personal and honest and provide so much because it's, yeah well thank you thank you it was a so grateful needed. experience yeah mm. it's been a real joy getting to know you I feel you know, really fortunate. I Me loved too. It. I appreciate it. All right. You have a great day. You great too. to meet you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in. I truly hope this podcast was of value to you. Please subscribe and let your friends and family know they can find But Seriously, the Cancer Podcast, anywhere podcasts are made available. To learn more about my cancer survivorship coaching, please go to BertScholl.com. That's B E R T S C H O L L.com. If you'd like to support But Seriously, the Cancer Podcast, please go to our Patreon page at patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash But Seriously, the Cancer Podcast. And thank you so much for all you do. See you all in the next episode, and thank you so much for listening. The intro and outro music you hear is the creation of St. Kid. 
can find him on social media as The Saint Kid. The purpose of this podcast is to provide a platform for individuals to discuss personal experiences with a medical diagnosis. The host and guests are not medical professionals, and the podcast is not intended to provide medical advice or psychological therapy. Whenever there is a concern about mental or physical health, please consult a qualified medical professional.